Hello and welcome to a very special podcast. We are talking about uh, the quintessential quintuplets, the hit manga series written by Neji Haruba that just celebrated its final chapter of, well, like two weeks ago. Uh, I am your host. Uh, a meat, uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but a meat bun a day makes you Itsuki's favorite student. I am Mediocrity4. Hello, nice to meet you all. I'm Takai. Uh, thank you for having me on the podcast. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, my name is Sophie B. I also have my own YouTube channel, uh, Sophie B Powerhouse, and um, I'm here representing all of us Genki girls out there. <laughs> and uh, come on, feel the ludes, uh, Quince, rock your foots, and get tutored, tutored, tutored. I'm Coop. <laughs> And I am as swift as the wind and as silent as the trees. I am Robert. <clears throat> nice. So I uh, the probably first... butchered that, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the first uh, kind of thing is uh, what are y'all's general impressions of this manga? Obviously, we all like it. If we didn't, we we wouldn't be here talking about it. Uh, <laughs> but What's your main takeaway from this, and, and especially with the way it ended? Uh, so, Takei, you go first. Yeah. Personally, I really, really enjoyed it. Like, there's a lot of romantic harem type stories out there, and after a while, they kind of all follow a lot of the similar tropes and stories. Really, it's kind of it did a lot of interesting things that were quite different from the normal ex- expectation to get from it. So I quite enjoyed that, especially the extra time it got to end. Like most things don't, most things just end after the confession. They don't get a little bit of extra time to actually lead things towards an end. Yeah, I, I will say this. What you got to understand about romance is that logic and reasoning behind stuff it plays a part of it but it doesn't play a big enough part you kind of have to fucking get it you know and like for a little while there i right up before the fucking uh confession at the end like spoilers but the, I thought that perhaps Negi didn't quite understand a huge philosophy of romance that I had to learn sh- through sheer experience. Uh, but right at that confession, he fucking pulled it out of the park. And so I got to say, dude knows what he's talking about when he writes about love. Yeah. Just 100%. This was a solid... I wouldn't say fully realistic portrayal of it, but given the premise, it was realistic with him. Yeah. And, yeah, so for me, it was, I don't know, first of all, like, a bit, what, like, it was, or, I don't know, I definitely fell in love with this manga because it's, it was very unique. Uh, my experience with harem manga is a little, with like the harem genre in general, is kind of limited. It's mostly Monster Musume and um, High School DxD. I'm that kind of trash, but it, it was, um, you know, it, I really liked how unique it was, how Neji definitely understood the genre he was working in and the. Um, the kinds of, uh, or yeah, and you know how to get the best story possible out of, uh, or yeah, and he yeah it seemed like he definitely understood how to get the best possible story and just tell a good uh story there with this uh whole. Or yeah, with the genre that he was working in, and so I really enjoyed that the. The ending kind er uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think I think Coop is definitely right that there is a certain uh 
or yeah, that love is not always logical and it's not always fair and it's all not always. Um, well, well, the main oh, yeah. thing, and it and it and it's not and like it's it's a matter of you know what goes on in a person's feelings. So the ending kind of stuck in my craw a little bit, but I understand that it was always Neji's plan, that Neji knew what he, like I, like you said, Neji knew exactly what he was doing the entire time. He knew what he was going for. And so the ending is just a matter of not how I would have done it, which does not make it a bad ending, does not make it, you know, inferior in any way whatsoever. It's just, it's just a personal preference and it was not my personal preference, but it was still a phenomenal manga and still a good ending. So that's that was that's my those are my overall feelings, and I took forever to say that. <laughs> if I if I might if I might like just explain like right off the bat what go the, for it. what the so the the main philosophy behind that, and it is a it is an explicitly illogical and self contradictory thing that is true about all love, and that is that love is both selfless and selfish. That yes, yes, absolutely. you want to give up as much as you can for the one you love, but you don't want to give them. Up. And uh, when when Yotsuba finally makes that turn to where she's not just sacrificing everything for Futaro and actually takes him for herself, that's when I was like, okay, yeah, dude actually does. Fair um, enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it was just Futuro's decision that stuck in my craw, basically. Like, like Yotsuba's arc and everything that she went through there, that was all, you know, really nice and really great, and I really liked that. It was just kind of like, eh, I don't know if that's the one I would have chosen. Mm-hmm. But anyway, sorry, Sophie, it's your turn. <laughs> that's A-OK. So... I came into this uh, manga anime first, actually. Um, I was bored and on Crunchyroll, and an acquaintance of mine had been daring me uh, now and again, just as a matter of kind of like a a game that we play, um, to to watch watch various different um, ecchi or harem genre anime. And... Uh, quintessential quintuplets uh, is labeled with the etchy label on Crunchyroll, even though it actually turned out to be, when I saw it, quite wholesome. <laughs> and um, yeah. I was I was pleasantly yeah. surprised, and um, immediately uh, I was drawn I was drawn to the character of Yotsuba. I usually am for Genki girls, but not quite to the degree that I was for for Yotsuba. Um, I am one of those very few people out there <laughs> uh, that, um, like, legitimately supported the idea that Yotsuba could and should be uh, the end girl from the beginning and yeah. went around collecting all of the tiny little shreds of evidence, picking apart the whole thing, talking about the stuff that uh, that was, like, in things that other people thought were like in, inconsequential or like didn't realize. Um, Did you write that forty page article? As, as she as she you? glares at me. Uh, no, 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 no. I was not the person who wrote the forty page article, and I actually, um, I actually didn't agree with a lot of the stuff that was in that original article. And I think it's actually up okay. to like fifty seven now. Yeah, but, no, um, that's what I saw. I, yeah, <laughs> I have I have done some writing for the sake of like the discord and stuff like Mm -hmm. that particularly when there were long drawn out conversations but Mm -hmm. i kind of i kind of wound up being somewhat of a de facto uh like kind of head of house uh i i referred to myself as the boss mama of the yokoza um (laughs) uh, who who uh was was basically kind of leading the charge on the on the pro Yotsuba victory train, and other people caught things that I didn't. Uh, I caught things that some other people didn't. And when it comes to the ending itself, I will say this: while I am happy that all of the analysis and research and narrative and theming that I thought was so important did in fact pay off 
in in some way and i am very glad to get that happy ending for futaro and yotsuba Mm -hmm. um i will say that it is a flawed ending in a lot of ways and Mm -hmm. i personally felt that there were some issues with the pacing um i also am a bit of a (laughs) if i'm gonna read something that kind of wants to establish itself as this kind of big romantic mystery like you know because it's it's a rom-com and the comedy elements were kind of at the forefront of everything else as well as the mystery and the romance was very light because Haruba Negi is somewhat of a um uh, he's very protective of his characters which is yeah. one of the reasons why it took so long to even get like figure like proper figurines and stuff like that and i i appreciate that kind of uh thinking <laughs> to an extent mm-hmm. but <laughs> um between the fact that he came to realize that weekly serialization was very difficult which it is and also the fact that he was being well no need to mince words very very prudish with his approach to the uh romantic goings on between these characters by the end of the by the end of the series i felt that there was a certain uh, it, it, that the series felt a little bit lackluster in the uh in the area of like raw passion and intensity of emotion and uh and and romance uh like yes the mystery of the bride is solved and yes the comedy is still there but the romance wound up playing so far so far back that it may as well have been sitting on the bench for all that anybody could hear the sounds of it. Um, we didn't get very many, like, really fluffy moments, super, super romantic moments were few and far between. All of, like, the kisses that show up in the pages were either, like, obscured or shot from a distance, drawn from a distance in this case. And for someone like me, who is, A, used to show Joe manga, and B, also reading some other manga from other shonen series from other publications, such as like Domestic Nakanojo, uh, where uh, Sasuke K, the author of that, she she draws it spicy. <laughs> she <laughs> she knows how to draw a spicy kiss. And so I'm just kind of feeling a little bit. Uh, I felt a little bit let down by um, certain aspects of the ending, but I was still overall happy that all of all of my personal fandom that i put into it paid off especially since i very rarely call them correctly when it comes to these sorts of uh, <laughs> anime and manga uh but i don't watch a whole lot of them either so <laughs> i will say this if you do want to see some fucking awesome edgy shit Watch Kondagawa Jet Girls instead. It's like IGPX, but with jet bikes instead of mechs. And with see, <laughs> instead of fucking uh, r- racing guys. I, I, I don't know what those are, and usually I try to avoid edgy content unless somebody is, like, paying me to do so. Um, <laughs> that's, 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 aside yeah. from the edgy, though, it's got some. In, it's got some nice little friendship. <laughs> it's it's wholesome, but there's tit shots. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just amazed that this was labeled edgy. Like, I, uh, we the anime. Just, the thing about it is, uh, EG, is the uh, is EG because of the sweater that she wears yeah. around her waist to make her butt look bigger. Well, <laughs> the, the the anime really does kind of play up. Uh, Ichika's flirtiness, uh, even more so than the yeah. manga did, uh, like like the, the scene, true. the her, it, it's not really her introduction, but it, it's her, it's the first scene with her in, in uh, her room, where she's like well, sleeping naked and stuff. Like that was just one panel of the of the manga, and they were yeah. like, "Oh, I sleep." Na-. They really kind of like dwelled on it a little bit in the anime. <laughs> well, and there yeah, is. I- if I didn't have a fucking roomie, I'd sleep naked too. It's a very comfortable uh, way to go to sleep. Th- there is also just a little bit of kind of like an early installment 
weirdness that you can attribute to to Gotobun. Um, there are some aspects of it that are a little bit more on the oh, nose. Oh, you mean the bit where Yosuba flashes like her panties at food row? Uh, no, that, that was in that's, uh, that's, that, that, was in, that, that was in the one shot, which is right. going to have early installment weirdness as a given because yeah. it's not being written for serialization just yet. But I'm I'm referring more to the fact that like you know. A lot of the characters played more fiercely into their stereotype in the very, very early chapters, including Ichika being a a flirt to like an obnoxious degree, yeah. almost. <laughs> and um, the real the real thing that I think got got it labeled edgy is that for the opening, which incredible song, very catchy, I love to sing it. Um, yeah. But for like the opening and stuff like that. Uh, they chose to do a lot of animation of the quintuplets wearing no clothes. Ah, <laughs> and, yes, um, my favorite like shot of the, the opening. Towel, and them all in the bath. Uh, them the, all in the, the bath, the paint, and it's circling the circle them shot, while yeah. they're doing the... It, it, it was just kind of weird, and they also made some odd design decisions during the, uh, during the anime where, like, for example, when... Um, <sighs> I can't remember the exact part right now, but Futaro is thinking about like where the girls are as far as like their efforts oh, and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that goes I, I and stuff. And about. it shows it it shows it shows them all running as if they're and like they're running totally running a track, naked. right? Run and and, and Yotsuba yeah. Yotsuba <clears throat> is running ahead of them. Well, yeah. in in the manga they were clothed, and for some reason in the anime they decided to make them naked. Nude. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I had to kind of do a double take on that because uh, I was reading Wood the manga. By animation. Because uh, that that was yeah. in like episode eleven, so I was already like reading and caught up with the manga and stuff. And so when it got to that part in the yeah. anime, I had to do like a, a double take. Like, did I just see that right? Um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, my opening weird. thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I I've gone on and on about the series in in other videos and Twitter and Discord, and I've even mm-hmm. had people telling me that that I need to shut up about it. But uh, <laughs> this series has had a very profound impact on me that I wasn't at all expecting or ready for, and uh, and not just I because just, you like redheads. Yeah, and I and I say without. Any, Which you should. Yeah, I, I say <laughs> without any hyperbole that this could very well be my favorite rom com in any medium. And um to to kind of white pill this a little bit, it it has been uh a constant source of joy and fulfillment in my life over this last year. And uh, it has helped me get out of some very dark uh, thoughts uh, the the last uh, few months. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the characters. Uh, and I said this yeah. in a video. Uh, for a rom-com, I never found it all that particularly funny. It gets a chuckle, you know, mm-hmm. like a chuckle every few chapters. Mm-hmm. Uh <laughs> But what always impacted me was the the joy in certain scenes, uh, the sadness, the anger, um, the the just the more raw emotional material, which again I just I wasn't expecting out of a shoujo rom com harem uh, thing. Uh, I, I just, it caught me off guard. Uh, and I'll tell you what moment it was. Uh, it was the Rena moment in the Seven Goodbyes arc. Uh, mm. When she basically saves his life. You know, he, he goes through a very dark thought. Uh, one that uh, I can, eh, can kind of relate to. Um not going to get into that, but, uh, you know, he, he's thinking like, he, he has the thought of, man, everything's falling apart. The girls are fighting. I can't do anything about it. I'm helpless. I'm useless. You know, the, this, this was something that was kind of starting to bring me fulfillment. And now it's, it's 
all just falling apart. Uh, maybe if I drown, they'll come together for my funeral. And he catches himself like, oh, whoa, 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 that's uh, a little excessive. Uh, there's got to be something else. And then Rena comes in and is like, uh, I see you're, you're, you're depressed again. Uh, and, and that whole exchange and that whole next chapter that followed has permanently lodged itself in my brain. And that was the moment that kind of kept me going uh, through, through all of this with, with as much passion as I was. Uh, I am very passionate about the series in a way that I haven't been passionate about a series since like early Naruto. Um, and yeah. I really got to thank Megan for that. <coughs> with that said, I think the ending did leave a little bit to be desired. And I think Sophie hit the, mm -hmm. hit the nail on the head when she talked about, uh, hit uh neji being too protective of his characters because to me yeah the ending result and stuff was fine i found it a little bit toothless that it didn't go far enough with with uh its ideas uh and it tried it tried making it tried making everyone happy it tried making all yeah. the girls happy mm. and keeping them all together uh, i was almost thinking like wait did he just slip a harem ending in there yeah like did he just like like is this like is this actually a hero ending or something? Like are they like it like I don't know. Was he like yeah? I was kind of like so. Wait, they're going with him on the honeymoon. Like what? What are they gonna be doing? <laughs> like I thought it was kind of funny, but I was kind of like what's well, going on there? But yeah, as, as, as someone who has had experience with these sort of things, there's typically two kinds of endings to this. There's the fucking full on. I got all of them ending, which is the chattest ending, though not the most realistic. Uh, and then there's the fucking uh, main girl wins ending. Uh, and Neji may have, uh, and this this could be a, a meta conclusion to reach about this, he may have decided uh, on a sort of hybridized version of this in order to please as many people as possible, which is not the way I would have gone about it. As yeah. I mentioned previously, I would have just had like four more spinoffs that would have been just been uh, branches from <laughs> yeah, like OVAs or something like that. Yeah, I yeah. feel I feel like Negi was going for a particular kind of ending, and I also feel that uh, as as we'd mentioned before, his overprotective nature with regard to his characters, especially when it comes to yeah. his seeming prudishness when it comes to the, the, the relationships and the romance and, and, and the physicality, the intimacy, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I think that the only thing that would have really worked out for the fandom as far as satisfaction goes would be if this had had a visual novel tie-in where you had different routes and it was, you know, yeah. a date, like a, like a dating game, but that's not going to happen. And if it is, it's going to wind up being this watered down mess, but, uh, like, like the one that but, I played. <laughs> well, and, I was, I was and so you need a visual novel for that. Like literally just spin off manga. It's been done before. Spin -off uh, yeah. It's yeah. more, it's more prominent in the light novel area, and it's also more prominent, like, for for series that are a bit more, I, I don't know whether or not to say fantastical or not, but, like, for all that, for all that the kind of, like, the, the primary premise of there being these high school uh, uh, pin-up model bombshell quintuplet sisters that this one guy gets to tutor for the most part the rest of the uh the rest of the story is fairly subdued and fairly like based in reality if you're going to talk if you're going to talk like spin-offs and stuff like that it's a huge heap of different compared to something like uh, uh, stuff adapted from key visual arts, visual novels, or something like Love Hina, for example, or something uh, like Tenchi Muyo, the, the, the OG, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think one of the issues really for me came down to the fact that uh, towards the end, like the final just like last trio of chapters or so maybe I think that Negi began to realize that 
he thought that everybody was on the same page as he was, only to then find out that that was not the case. Um, in some of his most recent uh, interview material and some of the stuff that, that was published alongside stuff like the final chapter and stuff like that, he makes it <laughs> he makes it seem almost like he thought it was like, obvious where his story was going in a subtle way and I know that probably sounds contradictory but like he makes it very clear he wanted one specific quintuple to win from the beginning and the only reason he didn't make it more obvious was because his editors told him no 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 that won't work and he had to work so hard to get around the cliche that the subtlety he used wound up backfiring on him because for example all of the folks who were like rooting for, for Yotsuba uh, from the beginning we wound up picking up these very tiny little things that everybody was saying that's just coincidence or that's not a clue that's too small and insignificant things like for example like the Karaage voucher or the mm -hmm. fact that he chose uh he chose a he he chose some kind of drink during the Ichika chapter in the festival and we don't get to see what it is. And people caught caught that and everyone was saying like at least on the on the Gotobun server on Discord, people in the other camps were saying those are just coincidences or no, that means nothing. And then it turns out, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, nay, nay, nay. That was, in fact, a, uh, a, a hint as to who the, um, the person that Futaro has fallen for is. And what do you know? It turned out to be Yotsuba for a myriad of different reasons. And whether you accept those reasons or not, it's like, okay. The problem is he wound up rushing, I feel, and I know that some people will disagree with me, but the pacing does feel very off in the last two volumes of this series. And, uh, and I think it was because of the fact that he thought he'd set the groundwork. He'd begun to get stressed about the fact that he was writing a, uh, he was drawing a, a weekly serialization that he wasn't prepared for. And he admits to as much in one of his interviews. Um, and so he was like, you know what? I know how it's going to end. I know how I can bring it to that conclusion. Let's go ahead and do it. People are going to be on board. And then he started to see, oh, oh, apparently people weren't getting the subtle clues I was dropping this whole time. Um, I better try to do a little bit of damage control in the last couple of chapters. And it's, it still kind of backfires yeah. because... He tries to make it seem like the girls are all happy and content to a degree, but at the same time, he's showing that Miku and Nino are literally using the Uesugi family bakery slash restaurant as their business now. They are intrinsically yeah. tied to them beyond that. Uh, and... Um, there are also implications, I guess, depending on which translation you were reading, but uh, I don't know how accurate that is, that that uh, Futaro and Itsuki could even be in, like, the same field as far as work goes. And yeah. we also find out that, yeah. oh, Yotsuba's living with Futaro, but we don't get to see any of that build-up or any of that other stuff. It's just like, oh, here you go. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, for me, uh, I don't think it was so much that was rushed... I actually felt it dragged a bit towards the end, uh, which to me, it seems like just general poor use of time, which I wouldn't have even noticed had 90% of the manga been very well paced. And uh, each chapter was very dense and full of little details and character beats and stuff. And it seems to me that he had like a really solid outline for everything that was going to happen in each chapter from the outset or, or as soon as he started like really kind of writing for uh, weekly. But when he got towards the end, uh, he had kind of grown as a writer and stuff. And I've had this happen to me with, with my stories where he's a different person than he was when he first made that outline. And it, it ends up having, he ends up, putting focus on the wrong things. 
Uh, and the mm. perfect example of this I can think of is Itsuki's part of the last festival, which I think was the lowest point uh, storytelling wise in the entire manga, because you would think that Itsuki's arc would be about Itsuki, not about the biological father. You would think that her dad issues. It, you, you would you would think that with something as you know on paper as important as oh the biological father is coming back and he's trying to take control of of these girls lives you would think that would be something for all the girls to deal with because he's all of their biological father and that it would be a really good point to have them all come together to stand against him and be like you you've done nothing for us you're a deadbeat you walked out on mom and we can never forgive you yeah. like you you just keep trashing. You just keep trashing our mom. Like you're, you're not even apologizing for what you did. You're just trying to come in here and, and take control because you think you have the right because you just happen to be our biological father. That's not what a father is, though. Yeah. You would think that would be the direction they go with it, but it, it stumbles in trying to make it something that ET has to do basically on her own she does get help from miku to pull kind of a bait and switch on him but miku doesn't really say anything in all she of just that stands there and glares um, um <laughs> nadra maru i was all like yeah. what the fuck are you talking about That's and not I, I, I like that they i like that he brought maruo and isanari in on that exchange but it still felt hollow it felt well, hollow I it felt hollow yeah, because I, the I, bio I, dad was very underdeveloped uh, he's only in like three chapters and he's just kind of a dick. Uh, but it, it also felt hollow because this should have been like the really big last, it should have been like the last ending of the Sister War. It should have been for Itsuki what the ending of Sister War was for Miku. And it wasn't. It, it didn't have enough time. It really, I mean, they squeezed it right in there at the end without really much warning. Like, that's the kind of thing that you should have had a lot more chapters to really build into, and especially considering it not only tied together, like, you know, the, not only brought in the father, but also you got a kind of glimpse back at the past, like you got to see, like, who was the father, how how did he relate to the mother, how did the other fathers relate to the mother? It's like, that, that was the past that we didn't really know much about. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I have the exact opposite opinion of all of y'all because I found it completely superfluous and I think everything that it accomplished could have been accomplished uh, by tying it into the other stuff that was going on and you could have cut it out completely. I actually kind of have I actually kind of have a similar sentiment if you're referring specifically to the stuff with with the bio dad, you know. Yeah, with the um, uh, uh, because I, I think here's the problem is that Negi opens it up by presenting it as a an Itsuki problem because he t he wants to try and tie it into Itsuki's dream to become a teacher. And so he opens it up as an Itsuki problem, but then the issue is, oh no, this can't just be an Itsuki problem because the bio dad encompasses far more than just the, the, the relationship between Itsuki and her dream of being a teacher and following in her mother's footsteps. So Especially what winds up happening is Itsuki can't solve the problem on her own or solve the problem just her and Futaro. So it's so it winds up not becoming an Itsuki centric chapter in truth because by the end of the arc, you know, by the end of the arc, they have to enlist the help of Isanari and Maruo and Miku has to get involved and all the other girls get involved and Futaro gets involved. And it becomes a thing where it starts as Itsuki, but then it encompasses all of the quintuplets and Maruo. And, uh, and, and, and it results in Itsuki more or less just being the same person she was at the beginning of that arc... Uh, just kind of, just kind of, just kind of reaffirming, just like, I want to be like my mom. That doesn't mean I'm going to make the same mistakes as her. Your, your, your nonsense, get out of the story. And he does. <laughs> Especially because they bring, because it is about, you know, who deserves to be their father. And they bring Maruo into that. And earlier in that arc, you've had, you know, this whole thing with Nino trying to reach out to Maruo and, 
you know, wanting to be with him. And it feels like that's something that, you know, they could have tied that into, but they don't really, Nino doesn't really have that moment of, oh yeah, you really are our dad. You know, you really are there for us. And yeah, it does kind of feel, yeah, like you said, it, I don't know, it kind of, yeah, it kind of takes away what we were, you know, people were kind of begging for Iski to get herself a really good arc and stuff like that for a really long time. And which, I kind of feel like that's the seven goodbyes arc, honestly, but yeah. uh, it, but it doesn't. <clears throat> but we don't. But it feels like yeah, it becomes less about Iski by the end. It becomes more about Marua, oh. which is you know, it's fine. I think it's nice that he gets that moment to really be the girl's dad, but it does kind of I don't know feel a little odd that mm-hmm. it started as an Iski thing and then became a Marua thing. Yeah. I, I will and say this: uh, became an everyone thing. If we're looking at it from the Maruo angle, uh, I, here's the thing. Like, he doesn't need something that overt. Like, he was... If you, if you had been reading the whole thing, you could subtly tell what his deal was in regards to them the whole, whole time. Yeah, he's just protecting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, like, the only re Like, you would have to not be able to to grasp some obviously subtle stuff, uh, which, I mean, like, obviously subtle sounds like a fucking, uh, fucking self-paradoxical thing, but it kind of was, if, mm-hmm. like, at least to me. I don't yeah. think anybody didn't notice that when they were reading it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you, know, you wonder, it's not hard to it believe was, that he cares, but... Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, for, for me, for me, what, for me what, uh, what brought Maruo kind of to the forefront and, and kind of showed that off was the scrambled eggs arc. And it's really kind of like blink or, or if you're just skimming, you'll miss it. Um, when, uh, God, it, it, it's Miku and I think Itsuki who try like sneaking out and Maruo busts them and he instantly knows who it is. <laughs> Which means he loves them and can tell them yeah. apart even when they're in disguises. And that's the only hint mm-hmm. that we get that he could do that until uh, he shows up at the last festival. It's like, wait, you just said Iski. Iski's not here. That's Miku. Uh, which was just comfort, a more overt confirmation of something that you could have picked up on if you thought about that moment in Scrambled Eggs a little bit longer. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think like did that moment come before they uh, the grandfather said that you can tell them apart with love? Because uh, if it came before, it been, then I guess that might be why it's meant. I I don't remember if it was before or after. I do know that that concept though was way before. Because the the yeah, first the time first time we was... hear about that concept is uh, through after Yotsuba, the through um, Yotsuba, the camp arc. Yeah. Yeah, it's Yotsuba when they're all. Yeah, it's Yotsuba when they're all when they're all wearing the ponytails and stuff like that. And Fudo yeah. is trying to figure out which of them has the failed tests and stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and so says, murder yeah, on the Orient it expressed it, it but... too. <laughs> so, so then, since since we begun to talk about the uh, the scrambled eggs arc, why don't we talk some more about the arcs that we thought were the strongest then? Because we've talked a lot about the ending and whether or not we feel like yeah. it was paced well just, or anything yeah, just, like that. I just yeah. want to point out one more thing about the bio dad. It's funny because just a few chapters earlier in that same arc, he did something similar with a different character, and I thought it landed very well. Takabayashi. Uh, Takabayashi comes in... No, she's someone who who is from Futuro's past, knew the Futuro yeah. of before, but only the Futuro of before. And <laughs> the Quints make that very clear when he when she's like getting all kind of handsy with him and, and he's like, Hey, these are some of my like few friends, you need to calm your tits. And she sees that <laughs> and she accepts that and then because she because she is Fudor, she still considers herself Fudor's friend. She does pull back and then actually confront Yotsuba, uh, kind of spurring her on <coughs> on her journey. Uh, so I think that was like you know, because Mudo, the the bio dad, is kind of same way. He knew the Ren, he knew Rena as a student, but really only as a student. Like he didn't get to see her or know her as a mother the way that the Quince did and the way that Maruo did. So Maruo and the Quince, they knew Rena on a level that the Biodad 
never did. And he never accepts that and, and, and just continues to go against that, which might have been Neji's intention. And I, I don't know if he really intended to kind of juxtapose Takabayashi with Draw Nudo parallel. that way, but that is something that I, I kind of picked up on uh, while I was uh, rereading it uh, a few days ago. If he did intend it, it, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty clear clear showcase of this person only knows Futaro from the past, but is still a good person. Whereas Mudo Biodad, he uh, <laughs> I don't know how I don't I don't know how Negi managed to accomplish it, considering how his characters all generally are 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 designed and stuff like that. But like yeah. from. From moment one, Mudo looks like the biggest freaking creep. Yeah. yeah. It makes me makes wonder, how on earth did he land the mother in the first place, even for a short while? I, that <laughs> yeah. is... I don't know. Sometimes when you're the older dude, you can get what you want just by being older. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Rena just had a teacher fetish. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, run in the family. Let's, oh, yeah. let's not so, go so, yeah. down that yeah, road, let's not. gentlemen. Let's um, <laughs> fuck down this road. I like it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, I was, let's, I was let's a talk motherfucking about... uh, teacher in high school, so I could land me a chick like that. Oh, no, fuck. no, no. no, no. <laughs> anyway. uh, as a person going into education, no. Um, so, yeah, let, let, let's talk about arcs that, that we really liked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, we we're already kind of talking about scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs is is my second favorite arc, and it's because yeah. I think it's the one that takes all six core characters on top of supporting characters like Maruo, Raiha, the grandfather, and even a little bit of Isanari, uh, and yeah. really pushes every single one of them forward in a way. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of that's kind of masterful. It does that in nine chapters. It pushes like what six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Pushes like ten characters forward in the span of nine chapters without skipping a beat, while yeah. also having this kind of intrinsic mystery that and that, basically through a yeah. So are you guys hearing me? Okay? Uh, or... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yes. So. Th this intrinsic uh -oh. mystery of, okay, what is going on with the girls? So each girl is dealing with with something or, or has something bothering them. And some of them, it's easier to tell than others. Like uh, for Futuro, like Futuro knows instantly what's bothering Nino. It's it's her confession and the fact that he doesn't have an answer for her and doesn't it isn't anywhere close to having an answer for her. And isn't isn't even really taking her confession seriously yet. He doesn't really start taking her confession seriously until the bell kiss. Um you know, so so that's obvious. Um Yotsuba it becomes obvious very early on that she's just nervous about like putting on the disguise because she's not good at disguises. Uh <laughs> though we find out there's way more deep psychological issues going through her mind regarding that. Uh, never, mm -hmm. never again. Uh, uh, and yeah. and uh, so, so that kind of leaves Ichika and Miku with, and with Miku, uh, the the problem is obvious because we had just come off the final exam arc. We knew what she wanted to accomplish in the final exam, and we knew that she, even though she Good. passed, yeah. she failed in her ultimate goal because her goal wasn't just yeah. to pass; her goal was to be the best. Uh, and she failed in that because Ichika beat her, um, mm -hmm. and so it, a lot of this is is um, Futuro figuring out and confirming what's going on and trying to figure out which of these girls is the one trying to break his relation with them, and why and what that means. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which he doesn't really figure. <laughs> She's kind of just like, you know, what? I'm just glad that you figured out it was me in the end. But yeah, it doesn't really. I don't know. Yeah, I'm think... not really ready to say like I want to be with you. But yeah, it's okay. I, I think to a degree, part of what she was happy about there was the fact he he managed to actually work out it was her. Like 
I think yeah. that was almost a win for her. Yeah. Because yeah, no, that, I mean, it was just like, okay, take the victory that you have here. So. Like, because honestly, that was one of my favorite moments. Like, obviously, this immediately reveals that I was a Miku fan. But, like, like that was one of my favorite moments. Like, the moment she's walking away, and you can tell, you know, he, you know he's got it wrong. You've, we've already seen that. And it's like, you, you really, really feel bad for her at that moment. Because she's like... But you can tell, and then there's sudden the realization as he works out. Wait, no, that's Miku. Like that was brilliant, and with the that and the panel after. That's, that's I, actually I... a good idea, though, that you just gave me. Um, uh, one, uh, uh fucking, uh, for all y'all listening, uh, uh, fucking, uh, try to guess before the end of this podcast which one we're all fans of, and uh, <laughs> if you get it right, you'll get some fucking ten. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, apart from all of the characters we have already stated that we are fans yeah. of. Yeah, but I haven't stated mine yet, nor Rob. Uh, yours is yours is as good as stated, considering the fact that Fucking you opened up it. your introduction with Lou. Well, name it, name it, name it what it is. Nino. <laughs> Wrong. Uh, I was a Miku stan from day one, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, so so that oh. means I was only half wrong <laughs> based oh. upon my no, guess. No, no, you're, you're about... <laughs> is it, is it, is it four, you're four-fifths wrong. <laughs> four-fifths. So, no, but, yeah. um, People just have to look at my avatar. Don't but anyway, number two <laughs> thing that I was going to get at was uh, fucking... What I... What one could come to from this, though it was never outright stated, that Foots just got a lucky guess in on Miku that time on. Well, no, this is... I don't know. To, to a degree, there was a bit of luck involved, like, because he had already narrowed it down to two of them. He was kind of... And part of how he realized was because he, re- yeah, he recognized the anger. Of clenching her fit. She... He saw her clenching her fist, and she knows that's a physical tick of hers. Yeah, like, yeah. like it, it, it was, it wasn't yet at the stage where he'd be able to tell her again. Well, out he of is kind of, of lucky you know, that she didn't just walk off after that. That he. Well, well, and that's the, the thing is that, was, like, he wasn't lucky that she didn't just walk off because, like, she was. Let's be real. Fucking the way Miku is, she's fucking desperate as shit. So, like, even if. He just got a lucky guess in. She was always going to interpret that as being a right guess, uh, like an actual like again? determination that he had made. I it. want to say that you're wrong because the way you worded that sounded incredibly rude, but you're not exactly wrong. She was definitely desperate for futaro to to see p to, to see beyond the 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 disguise and to the quintuplet the actual identity yeah. underneath but i do kind of also agree because i know i know a lot of people especially the miku stands uh wanted to argue that like oh well this is the proof that he's got love is that he's he is able to figure it out eventually but it's like well she had to it's give her. She had to. She had to more or less. She had to more or less hold a megaphone up to uh, up to her mouth and shout it from the rooftops. By the time, by the time he was done, because he had he had stated his guess already, and she had already decided to play into that guess. And it was only because he noticed a tick uh, when it comes to her, the clenching of her fists. And that's the big thing that I think a lot of people like either neglected or they chose to ignore it or they just didn't give it as much credence yeah. as it was uh deserved but like I mean, part of what part of what the grandfather says <clears throat> about what love is basically you know defined as in this instance of 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 being able to recognize these girls individual identities is learning their habits their mannerisms their way of speaking their way of moving those physical and verbal tics and all that other kind of stuff it's part of the reason why futaro is able to so quickly recognize yotsuba and everybody's like oh but that's just because yotsuba is an idiot and it's like well see that's the thing is that yotsuba's personality is easy for futaro to recognize but that's partly on her and partly on him. As for Miku, 
Miku is actually known to be the best actress among her sisters. Ichika even says that Miku is probably better than she is. Yeah. Um, so she plays her part very, very well. And as we go on and learn more through the story, Fudharo does not give Miku nearly the kind of attention uh, that Miku gives him. And so the the few little bits and pieces that he's able to 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 really pick pick apart and, and knit together uh when it comes to M- Miku's identity in scrambled eggs uh is more or less him floundering <laughs> he, yeah. he's floundering and he's and... making a guess in desperation and it just kind it just happens to pay off for Miku yeah and, and, it I, might sound and, I, cruel, and I think but... she i think she recognizes that which is why she didn't like try to confess right then and there or try to take it any further she she kind of yeah. she does recognize that like he's not quite there yet but he's getting there and that maybe yeah. he'll be there someday you know that there is a reason for her to hope uh and we do see I, I by the end that... we do see by the end that he does get to a point where he does love all five of them enough to be able to pick them out when they're all wearing uh, the the wedding dresses yeah. and and have their hair the same way and and that kind of pays off his first attempt at doing such things where he got all of them wrong including the one who is literally like wearing her name on her shirt. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that the that it is like a lot of things in this whole deal are a really twenty twenty hindsight thing. Like up until the very end, yeah. you can't really look. Like, like if as it was going on, it was harder to determine. But when you go yeah. to the end and you look back on all the stuff and and then look uh, look through it and see all of the little hints that were laid out, you understand it far better. And yeah. of course, well, and that's and kind that of is... the way it, it. That's the way that mysteries are designed to work. Is yeah. that the people who are more knowledgeable? You know, it's like when you're when you're reading a Sherlock Holmes story, and you think you might have missed a few clues, and you're waiting for it to all come together. When when Holmes finally does the breakdown and lists all of the evidence and puts the puzzle together for you, you can finally see the whole picture of how it all fits and stuff like that. Now, some people were able to piece it together bit by bit over the course of the story, especially like with regards to certain things. I know one of the very, very popular phrases uh, in the Yokoza long before even chapter 90 happened uh, was break the chains because uh, there was a lot of association um, symbolically between Futaro and Yotsuba of Yotsuba being chained down by her self-esteem issues and, and, and comparisons to her sisters and stuff like that and um, and Futaro wanting to set her free and we get in the Yotsu date and stuff like that uh, uh, the Labor Thanksgiving date chapters we, we see a lot of symbolism when it comes to the swing set and then again and um these things some people were able to notice but then yeah. again some other people they got caught up on things that Haru Negi himself has now said no 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 those were actually not nearly that significant you gave them that significance essentially in your own head <laughs> when it yeah. wasn't actually there like for example the bracelet <clears throat> Um, which was a big staple of the people who were rooting for Nino, is they thought that the bracelet was this big piece of symbolism, and it really wasn't. I, I, th- uh, I think it is, the, uh, but it, it and, takes on new me- See, like... Uh, to be fair, like, you you gotta understand, like, uh, it, for... I'm gonna put this... I'm gonna actually blame Negi for this one. Because, yeah the the bracelet isn't that symbolic or whatever but it's on the same level of being dramatized as everything else he keeps everything at the same level of subtle even the mm-hmm. even the valid clues so you could literally take all, pretty much almost anything and be like oh this is this this is like evidence of the same level of importance and it was it was it was told with the same level of impact in the story so which was a way of keeping it like you know under wraps until the very end on his part i think 
but I don't think he can go back now and start blaming other people and being like, oh no, you well, gave this too much You gotta also remember that the way that he was writing from it, like for example, was present present things that could be clues and then close their stories at yeah. different parts of the uh, at different parts of the narrative to make to make the readers go oh okay so that isn't actually a clue the problem is is a lot of people got hung up because Nikki didn't do a very good job of that with some things the bracelet in yeah. particular part of the reason why is because he explicitly showcased the fact that the bracelet has some measurement of importance to Futaro in the future to the point that he's yeah. still wearing it at the wedding. Right. And that, in a lot of people's minds, immediately said, like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> it's it's a simple bracelet, and it was given to him by his sister, and, 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 and if he wasn't, if he wasn't, like, have it, if he didn't have some kind of like intrinsic connection to this on like a romantic level because of his bond with Nino or something like that, why would he be wearing this on the day of his wedding when it's so, so old, it's so frayed, and it doesn't match up? And then Negi goes on to be like, well, the bracelet story was wrapped up at the end of Nino's whole spiel. Yeah, in seven uh, goodbyes. In seven goodbyes. And Futaro has had the has apparently we were supposed to we were supposed to basically come to the understanding the realization even that Futaro has had the bracelet since the end of Seven Goodbyes and it it bears no more no more narrative weight because of that but people couldn't come a lot of people didn't reach that conclusion because it didn't fit where he had and this is part of the problem with writing a story that that's all one gigantic flashback with flash forwards and, and flash further back and all this other kind of stuff is that you have to really, really carefully weigh every single item, every single character and, and, and make sure that you're getting it the proper importance. And I think what happened is that Negi misrepresented the bracelet. And I think that people, for good reason, attributed more value to it than um than he was actually giving it mm -hmm. in his own mind so i think uh and this is i will go more in depth as, as i write that part of the breakdown um because <laughs> i think the bracelet is significant just not in the way that that people thought it was and and i'll give you guys like kind of the cliff notes version of it so this bracelet is something that that drew him and Nino together, yes. But it is also something that his sister gave him uh, for good luck. Uh, and it's something that, you know, through, through the use of the bracelet, through the whole Kentaro subplot, it helped bring all of them together. Not just him and Nino but all, all six of them, uh, because it, it, it's that bracelet. It's, it's saying it goodbye. Kentaro is one of the seven goodbyes. Yeah. And it's something that, mm -hmm. that helps, you know, <clears throat> come back, uh, and, and come back to her family, the, this family that she, she loves more than anything in the world. Um, and it helps her accept Fudero. It helps, her welcome Futuro into that family to where he becomes on the same level as her sisters, meaning that she loves him and her sisters more than anything in the world. And, and it's all symbolic, like why she's even at the wedding, why she, why she doesn't regret things at the end and why she is able to accept Yotsuba because at the end of the day, no matter what her feelings for Futuro are, she does love him. And she also loves Yotsuba, and she loves all of her sisters, and that's why she even gives Futuro a chance at the beginning. Uh, well, not the very beginning, but from like chapter mm -hmm. six, uh, from, from from well, from <laughs> chapter six onward, um, when when they do the the sure. the trial, and Nino like realizes that oh my god, people are actually siding with Futuro on this, and not with me. They must like Futuro. 
I have to deal with them because I can't say no to them. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it, it, she loves mm-hmm. them. She loves them so much she, that she's able to put up with someone that she actively despises just to appease them. And we see that a lot more in the fireworks arc, um, and, and in the midterm arc when when she actually vouches for him and, and kind of sticks her neck out for him against their father, uh, and then that that really comes to a boil because that was stressing her out because she does or did actively despise Futuro, uh, and that comes to a boil to where she just can't take it anymore in Seven Goodbyes. Uh, yeah. Which is why she has such such a major focus in that arc, uh, though all the characters do. The only one who kind of gets, I guess that we should bridge into seven goodbyes because that's my favorite arc. Uh, <laughs> but I'll let you all talk because I I, I do think the bracelet is significant. Yeah. It's just symbolic of all of them coming together, and, and yeah. it, it's kind of it's it is his tie to Nino, but Nino was also kind of the only one who was actively spiteful and antagonistic towards him yeah. for a very extensive period of time. Yeah. Yeah, in regards mm-hmm. to that, that arc, the seven goodbyes, I think uh, uh, that was probably the moment I actually started liking Nino a bit more. Like, it was. To begin with, yeah. <laughs> to begin with like, it was difficult to like her at times. Like, sometimes I liked her, sometimes I didn't. Like, the fact, you know, in, like, chapter one, she literally drugs him and sh- he wakes up in a taxi on the way home. Yeah. Like, that, that, so, that... Oh, gosh. Hey, that's that, just how you handle it. Um, I, I, I do have to say that that made it a very, very... Because di- I already don't care for Sundere characters. It's it's a very very mm-hmm. tired, cliche slash trope, whatever you want to call it at this point. It's a very tired characterization, and the extremes <laughs> to which Nino's Sun Sun behavior stretched at the beginning um, really bothered me. And maybe it's mm-hmm. because of my own you know personal personal reasons and stuff like that. And maybe I've got biases. But I feel like there's a very, very clear, like, no point where you have to work a lot harder to be forgiven in my eyes as both, like, a reader and a person when you roofie a character not once but twice over the course of the first yeah. half of the series. And while I mean, it's, it portrayed, it's portrayed as if it's intended to be comedic, which I don't care for, and I feel like the only reason it gets away with it, like, and I say, I say get away, gets away with it with very, very big quotation marks, but um, uh, why it, why it, why a lot of people decide to overlook it, I should say, um, is because it's a girl doing it to a guy. Yeah. And whether it's a girl doing it to a guy or a guy do, doing it to a girl, drugging somebody's drink and them waking up in an unfamiliar place and very, all that very, other very kind of stuff, okay. it's not okay. And it's very traumatic. And so that coupled with her her extreme soon soon behavior uh, in the first yeah, half, uh, <laughs> she, she, had, she had a lot of stuff to make up for. And I would have found it incredibly dissatisfying had she come out of the story the victor because it would be such a it would be such a tale of oh it's okay as long as your abuser starts to treat you nice later on it then then your relationship will be fine and that's really not a good message to send to anybody so she was because, kind of like so she was kind of like always on the same level as Ichiko post 74 post chapter 74 for you basically like she well, I she never actually kind of on the same level for you, or you I know? I never actually I never disliked Ichika as fiercely as a lot of other people did when it came to her snick behavior. <laughs> as they call I mean, it, it was um, a very interesting development, but it was kind of the was all like, okay. Yeah, no, she doesn't. <laughs> See, let, let's hold off on each first sec just while we're on the seven goodbyes arc committee because that'll get us yeah. hold, 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 that'll hold, get us into the I, sisters I, arc. I got I got a little bit of something. It is possible to uh do and i'm like obviously nega didn't go this way with it because it it actually requires some fucking deliberate fucking confrontation about it 
but it is actually possible to go from an abusive thing to a non-abusive one that actually works out. And it's, well, this. yeah, that is but possible. I, lot, I will, I will admit that, but it work. takes more work than was present in the story as yeah, we were yeah, given. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I mm-hmm. just, I like from my own experience, and well, not my experience, my dad's. So he was having this car ride with my mom this one time, and I forget exactly what the story was like, but my mom fucking, uh like straight socks him in the jaw and he grabs her by the arm real firm and he says this is the fucking last time neither of us is ever going to hit the other one ever again and mom was like you know that was the fucking branching path and she was like she took the fucking path uh, of least resistance and she was like yeah you're right that was a fucked up thing to do to you I'm sorry we're never going to do this again. And they never did. And those two are probably what I would look to for anyone as the best example for love of any kind. Because while they were together before my mom died, they were the happiest couple that I had ever seen in my entire life. And that's like an objective fact because I had never seen any other couples and I had seen a shit ton of couples that got along as well. And we're so romantically involved with them, even after years of being together. Like, yeah. the, you know, so. Well, and see, and that's an understandable and a, and a, and a totally, like, genuine approach to that sort of situation. And I think part of the problem for me is the lack of confrontation over it. And a lot of people point Did out, well, that's, that's, apologize that's. apologize for what she does? Well, no, but no, but I no. think a, a lot of people a lot of people bring up the fact that that's a culturalism, because you know, uh, in 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 Japanese culture, it's a lot it's a lot more commonplace and even uh, promoted as a you know to do the more like water under the bridge thing and just not not worry about that stuff, especially if you're if you're the forgiving type, just forgive it, don't bring it up, move on, don't don't address it, don't confront it. Is it a um, and I, thing or is it an anime thing? No, well, I've seen I'm, I've I'm seen it argued I, I've I've seen it argued that it's a cultural thing because I, I I know that there's a huge thing when it comes to personal privacy and all that other kind of stuff when it comes to when it comes to uh, Japanese uh, culture and society uh, and the sheer like. The sheer level of personal, uh, I, I almost want to use the phrase intimacy that would come with like having to confront somebody over a situation like that is, uh, is, is like a big deal. And since Futaro is clearly written as not actually caring all that much about it, a lot of people brush it off because it's like, oh, Futaro already forgave her. For him, it's water under the bridge. He doesn't even want to acknowledge it. Just move on. You shouldn't be getting, as the reader, shouldn't be getting so hung up on it. But it's like, well, well, I kind of have to get hung up on it because uh, without confronting it and without addressing... Yeah. Even even in my in my opinion, I think it kind of goes beyond just being an American. And I and I know that we're not all Americans in this in this particular chat right now. All so you. sorry. To um, it. <laughs> but e- but even if you wanted to argue it as a matter of like West versus East or anything like that, I think even even for somebody in Japanese society, it's like I feel like in real life it's a situation that would have been addressed because you have to ask yourself all these different kinds of questions about everything that went into the process of Nino thinking it was okay to drug somebody. Uh, Like where did she get, where did she get pills with enough power to knock Futaro out the moment he drank his, uh, the moment he drank his glass well, of see, water. That, 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 Okay, well, there's an implication there because her father, her her, her father is is a doctor, 
Did she get the prescription from him? Was that a legally acquired prescription for sleep medication? She was Putting it in somebody's drink is a criminal yeah. act. So it's like, yeah, uh, lots, lots of, lots of like fridge logic and fridge horror and, and all that other kind of stuff. Yeah. And of course, yeah. people are going to argue, oh, it's a rom com anime. You're not supposed to read that deeply into it. And it's like, well, it's supposed to be as, as somebody who, who has a vested interest in. Uh, not having other people slip drugs into my drinks, yeah. um, I feel it's a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit. Uh, it's <laughs> what's the, yeah, but I, I, I think it, it, it's I think, weird uh, to ignore it. Kind of, to kind, of, to kind of wrap up this conversation, though, because poor Takei has been waiting so long to talk about seven good. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. But I, I, think, I think you're right about like. You. I think you're right about it being a culturalism <laughs> because of the way. It does flash in Nino's mind a couple times, uh, in the last uh, three or four arcs, where she's like, "I never treated him that bad, right?" And then she flies like, "Oh, hmm. Uh, well, I'm not treating him like that now." Uh, <laughs> and then it likes to suppress yeah. it exactly. It's like, so, "Well, I'm not treating him bad anymore, so it's okay." <laughs> so, so, so just one yeah. one last joke, and then I'll pass it off to TK. Uh, she was just feeding Futuro's ketamine addiction. <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, you, got, you got it. Well, fuck, fuck, man. I will say this. As a guy who has uh, had to do oxy due to my fucking headache in, uh, induced via mouth bacteria entering my brain uh, and had a uh, fucking uh, animated sketch a la the Take On Me music video dreams about Batman raping people, including the Joker, uh, I will say... Uh that oxy is pretty easy to get your hands on so that's probably what nino used please <laughs> but, uh, but like just finish it up this as well because i was going to add something here and stuff i do at least like how like nino herself acknowledges it's not e going to be easy for her her to get him to then like her because how, how she's treated him like, I like to, I think, like, probably the only reason Futuro's let the whole thing go with the whole being drugged twice thing is the first time he need like, he needs the money from this job. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't like her, and he doesn't like this, but it's like, well, I'm in debt. I need to be paid. I'll just, I'll, I'll just put up with this and be wary of her so I don't get caught again. The second time, he's probably just so relieved that the problem's been solved, he probably think. He's probably just pushing it to the back of his mind, even though he shouldn't. But it's like that's probably probably both times there's reasons why he's probably let it go because he's trying, as you said as well, like the culture of it. He's probably just trying not to rock the boat now that it's now that it's stable. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so most of the seven goodbye stuff is we've kind of like roughly discussed, but like it's it was. The point where Nino started becoming likable again because her antagonistic ways have slowly began to stop. And of course, then she goes, We've seen her full soon. Now look at her full dare. Like, as, as the whole memes in the community go, she becomes the unstoppable stoppable train. The, no, the unstoppable runaway train. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the runaway. The well. clearly stoppable train. <laughs> yeah, the very clearly not quite so runaway train that, that everybody <laughs> thought that she was gonna that she I'm was gonna be. What Anitika thought she was, it was more that she was just very determined and very Look, I'm gonna say it right fucking now. All the fuck memes that came out of this community were trash and they were not funny and y'all are shit at oh, making memes and you should maybe fucking oh. go around and try and fucking get more lit on your meme skills i don't <laughs> i don't make memes so you can't go blaming me i was not so, so, so obvious. So obvious. i did like that joke, <laughs> the the trade joke but yeah <laughs> so, some of them are just too obvious like like in the when there's the whole, like, date thing with Yotsuba and uh, Futuro, it's the one where I'm pretty sure this was an exact lie to say, but it was like, want to do it? 
It's like yeah. that was made a meme instantly because it was so Small. perfect. Yeah, yeah I mean, that was just a chuckle. That was just already smirk. a joke. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was already a joke yeah. present in the manga. Yeah. Like Negi knew what he was doing when he drew that panel. Mm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, go to K. You, I, I know you have more yeah. to say about like seven so- advice and stuff. Well, the most of the seven goodbyes was kind of about the evolution of going from hating Nino to liking Nino. The arc I really want to talk about is the Sister War car. A Sister War uh, arc. Yeah, let's yeah, talk about people, Ichika and, and, next. Yeah, the arc that basically made me also, quite like... like or, I uh, Ichika was kind of... I kind of liked her generally. That arc, even though I also hated her actions... I also really liked her actions because one of the things a lot of harem stories never really deal with is what happens when multiple girls like one guy. A lot of the time you see them like form a like a a peaceful bond or almost something. Like if to use a more recent example, there's a series called We Can't Study. I'm not gonna try and pronounce the Japanese name. We but, never learn, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that series recently kind of that with all the girls realizing, or like all the three main girls realizing they all like the same guy, and there's no real confrontation about that. It's kind of like, oh, we all like the same guy. It's really happy and things, and you never truly really know they're gonna have to deal with the fact what only one of them likes it. But it also is like that. It's generally very peaceful. We got here, the like we saw the confrontation that happens when, both, like we have. Each girl who's basically trying to support Miku this entire time, dealing with intense jeal- like jealousy, feelings of guilt, and eventually it snaps. She decides, it's like, because she's been told it's okay to try and go ahead and get what she wants. And she really, really goes for it. Like, to the point that it actually, well, that's the entire reason it's called the Sister War arc. She actually causes the conflict between the sisters and does quite a Big damage in that arc. Like you don't I see that a lot. Crazy eyes when she. I love the crazy <laughs> eyes when she says, you know, when she disguises I, Miku. But yeah, I think I kind of get your point. Is you're saying you're saying is that um, it, it, it's it's kind of a thing in uh, harem uh, anime in particular, harem manga and stuff like that, where you tend to see a lot of the girls attempting to win over the guy, but a lot less, uh, uh, conflict between there. Yeah. There's, there's no conflict between like the girls themselves. You very rarely see them getting, getting, uh, hyper, hyper aggressive or competitive towards each other to the kinds of like degrees that you wind up seeing in like sister war, for example. Yeah. Yep. And in this case, Neji has no problem going there, no problem basically making Ichika the villain of the arc, kind of making her the antagonist. And yeah, like you said, she goes for it just kind of in the snacky, dishonorable way, basically. So, <laughs> hey. yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the moment where you got Yotsubo realizing she's encouraged her sister. But then she's realized what she's encouraged her to do, especially when she's all, she's also supported Miku. Miku's breakdown, like, and basically, Nino's kind of like, like anger, basically. Yeah. How, like, you know, she she's willing to, like, go to a lot of lengths, yeah. but she doesn't want to damage her own relationship with her sister. Whereas, kind of, each girl just went full on, I'm going for the guy, like, you, you don't see that very often, but like it's also yeah. realistic, you know. When people love someone, they do want them. Like it's, it was the moment where you also could probably tell this is not going to be a harem ending at all, no matter what people say, yeah. because it's they can't. It's not going to happen. They can't. Like we've seen, they can't all love the same guy because they all want to be special. Yeah, and this mm-hmm. is war arc for me was definitely the part where. Uh, Oh yeah, that that for me was definitely was pretty much the point where I was like full on rooting for Miku and stuff like that. I was, yeah, big. I was a big Miku fan, and that was basically the point where I really started rooting for her. And I think uh, media, you kind of nailed it on the head a little while ago, where you said that Miku kind of peaked too soon. I think that if like 
the sister of war arc had had like been if, like the end had, had it been like yeah, the final arc been nearer to the end or if like if Yotsuba's uh if like the reveal of Yotsuba being the lolly Kano had been like you know I take a place before it then I think you know and again this is Neji knowing what he is doing and knowing what he's going for because um he because he didn't have you know the or yeah the Sister War take place at those points. He and you basically said like Miku pe- peaked too early to be the, you know, to be the bride. And yeah. I think that's pretty much it. Also, I've been realizing throughout this broadcast as we've been talking that uh, I think Neji was kind of, or was definitely looking at this more as a mystery. Like he was definitely going more from the idea of okay, who is the bride, and not necessarily yeah. going at it from the well, direct. Is, and again, like... this is, and again, this is kind. of and again, kind of like Coop said at the beginning, you know, romance is complicated. It's not always a matter of who deserved it. That, you know, it wasn't, I guess, in a, I, look, so look, look, this look. is where I feel like if this was more of a romance and more about a protagonist working towards a goal and working towards achieving a desire and changing and learning and you know achieving these needs then i think miku would have been the bride because she is i feel is the one who went through the most changes throughout the course of the series again like you know re-watching it you see a lot of what yosuba goes through throughout a lot of it but when you look at who's really working for it and really going for it and again and in the sister war particularly the one who really has to have this uh, call to action and really work for it. It, you know, I feel like that is more Miku than, you know, really anyone else. I feel like the only other candidate is maybe Nino, who also changes, or maybe even Iski, who yeah. changes pretty significantly. Whereas it feels like all of Yotsuba's changes happen, like basically her entire arc is basically a is in her flashback. It kind is kind of what it felt like to me, and that's why it. That's why Fudro's choice of Yotsuba stuck in my craw. That's why it was I, you know, it it wasn't as cathartic for me as I would have liked. So sorry, I've talked a lot and so, uh, shut up. No, no, so, no, no, Robert. Like, and it looks I'm, like a lot of people want to talk. But yeah, I, I, I will say this about that. Okay, so the thing about, and this kind of goes down. This is like a deep level of story versus reality type, of, like. Yeah. How realistic can you get with something to the point that it no longer becomes satisfactory? Because, Leos, like you said, in real life, you can work very hard for somebody you love and still end up losing out to some other bitch on the fucking block. Yes, uh, absolutely. But, absolutely. But, but uh, in a story, we want the hero to win, and we want the mm-hmm. person who worked the hardest to get what they were working towards the whole time. So, so like, is it, is it a satisfactory ending with Yotsuba who had her stuff all up in the backstory? That's for you to decide. Yeah. And that's and that, is that can't easily be answered <laughs> yeah. widespread. It, does, it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help that media was... Oh no, no, sorry. Um, not media. I'll, I'll let you go in a sec, media. But um, it doesn't help that Miku was very popular. Like, I mean, she became very popular for about Chapter 3, I think, was her first arc. Yeah. Uh, and, like, she became obscenely popular. <laughs> like, well, yeah, like, chapter yeah. Chapter 4 was the one where she's, like, taking off her leggings. So... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so that, from that point on, like, that arc after arc after arc, she like skyrocketed. Yeah. Like, there's a reason she was one of like the top contenders like for a long time. And as you said, she peaked a bit a bit too early. Yeah. In fact, maybe that's why a lot of her like a lot of her stuff did end up being early because maybe then she realized, oh, we, this is the runaway She's train. I need to stop. Yeah. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I think hey, we want to use the mystery. F- the thing aspect, Miku turned out was the red herring all along. Yeah. And so, that's... so, so I think uh, Miku's arc is the most satisfying, uh, and I, I, I was satisfied with all the arcs, um, at least on the individual arc level, uh, because I don't, 
you know, the stuff with Bio Dad doesn't count as an individual arc. Um, <laughs> because that should have, that should, as I said before, that should have been something all of them to deal together. Um, Miku's was the most satisfying. And I think it's because it, it had such a clear goal so early on that she's constantly striving for, which is uh, finding her own self-worth, which is something that is also extremely relatable. Like, Mm -hmm. and and especially, like, for for someone in my position and, and, you know, trying to find ways to to express myself in a healthy way, which is something that I had always struggled with ever since I was a kid. Um, But... You know, I do think Miku's arc peaked. I think it peaked at the right time for her, especially considering where the story was going after that. Because, you know, we got the sister war and that's like the closest she gets to an actual victory with Futuro. That's her date with Futuro. Um, Yeah. And then we get we get the four chapters of Yotsuba backstory after that. And then literally next time we see Miku, she's happy and she's happy with herself. For the first time in the entire series, her <laughs> happiness isn't for Lion Talk Hero or any other characters. I think, I, I think that this kind of ties into part of the thing that I was talking about back when I was talking about issues with pacing. Is that in order for this to be an equal mystery, right? In order for this to be an equal mystery, you have to present uh, an, an, an equal situation. But part of the problem that I had with the festival arc was that that was not the case because there were only two people that Futaro could choose and not immediately have them say, yes, let's get into a relationship right now. And well, that that's was what I thought was going to happen. Itsuki and Yotsuba is, yeah. uh, is, is had Futaro based upon the way that the manga was written. Right, yeah. and how the festival arc was handled. If Futaro had chosen anyone other than Yotsuba or Itsuki simply because of the nature of their narratives up until that point, uh, the story would have been more or less done unless he intended to make like a situation where Futaro chooses the wrong, well, quote unquote, wrong girl the first Bait time and, and then has to learn. Yeah. that he's actually in love with a different one, but that would go against the premise that he had already set, that yeah. the wife was somebody he had already developed feelings for at the time of the scrambled eggs arc. So you have yourself a conundrum because you're suddenly presented with a situation where, oh, Nino's narrative has has wrapped up as far as the as far as like her and Futaro go, if Futaro accepts her confession, uh, she's going to say yes, and they're going to start dating, and that will be more or less that. Like, the, the manga pretty much has yeah. to end at that point. Yeah, it w- it Same would... thing with Miku. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ichika would have been a little bit of a different story because you would have had to address how they were going to handle their relationship since Ichika intends to go overseas to become an actress. Yeah. But only Yotsuba and Itsuki really had... Th- the remaining situation of well where do they stand on the romantic level when it comes to Futaro and um and again by that point Miku and Nino had sorry sorry and by that point Miku and Nino had both already kind of peaked like we said so yeah go ahead exactly yeah exactly so so I think I think honestly if you were going to end it at the festival arc then I think Miku would have been the best option um, it's actually kind of one of the situations that I thought was a little bit, uh, was a little bit odd because it, when you like, cause the way that Negi presents that particular arc, um, and, and I know this is kind of get, drifting a little bit away from the topic of the, of the character of Miku and the previous, uh, the talk of the sister wars arc, uh, but, um, but part of the issue that I kind of had uh, as it pertains to the pacing surrounding these characters again is that a lot of stuff for characters that uh, a hefty portion of the of the fandom felt were the ones more quote-unquote deserving 
of 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 the victory, you know, of being the end girl by the by the end point of the narrative because they'd been the ones who were changed the most. And first and foremost, it's a total narrative faux pas to approach writing as if a character has to change in order to be a quote unquote developed character or a good character. Total narrative faux pas. That is not how writing works. You can have characters who do not change all that much or even at all, as long as you present it in a in a particular kind of context that fits for that character. Yeah, uh, the, the way I uh, the way I heard it stated yeah. is that uh characters don't have to change. They have to be presented with the opportunity to change. Uh, yeah, yeah and that exactly. that was that no, was some that was a creative that was a creative writing uh student uh on youtube uh talking about batman arkham asylum uh and how <clears> batman <throat> is presented with the idea of go or presented with the opportunity to go crazy to turn into a titan to big turn into a big dumb monster and he doesn't like he doesn't actually change yeah. that game it's a wonderful yeah. story and it's yeah and it's not just it's, and it's not just that miku changed that had me rooting yeah. for it. it's also it's just the fact that i mean to and it, and like that's good that's part of it you, you know i hope people understand that it's okay for characters to change as you know that they don't have that it's not essential but they can but also it's just the fact that i felt like she was working for it as well that she was putting in the most effort for it which in earlier chapters it felt like neji uh considered to be important so that was another part of your sorry go ahead oh, oh. No, well, well i mean all i was really all i was really leading up to was just the fact that if the story had been paced a little differently or the ending had come at an earlier point or anything like that i could have seen miku working i still yeah. wouldn't have been able to really see nino working very well but uh but but as far as Miku goes, uh Miku was honestly my number two. Uh if Yotsuba wasn't going to be the bride, I think that Miku had the most the most uh uh fully fleshed out and developed uh uh character arc and story and narrative, as well as a very, very legitimately cute interaction and romance with Futaro. And I think she could have she could have been a fantastic in girl regardless of whether or not she's super popular or anything like that you know we have a similar yeah. situation with like if you want to compare a different uh, anime with lots of uh, female cast members that love the main character um uh re zero um with rem rem is far and away the more popular character between her and amelia best best but, right, dude. but uh like Wait, isn't Rem the fucking one that's a trap? <laughs> no, 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 that's no. That, that is Felix. That's oh. Felix there. He's the he's the guy the, the cat, cat, cat person. Okay. Uh, okay. But Rim Rim is the blue Rim is the blue haired uh, ogre Maybe. twin. Maybe. Uh, the, the, the blue haired maid. Uh, yeah. yeah, and 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 she is far and away the more popular between her and Amelia, but. Uh, but Amelia is the one that has that connection between between her and and Subaru that really that really hammers home the fact that like this is his like one and only. Now the author makes up for that by having lots and lots and lots and lots of side stories that take alternate universe approaches to the to to the main narrative. So so fans can still get fans can still kind of have their cake and eat it too in that regard. But when you have a well defined, well well liked and, and and fully fleshed out character like Miku or even like Rem, um, it's not hard to see them being the main the main girl or the end girl uh, uh, when all is said and done, regardless of if they're just designed to be waifu bait or any of those other degenerative terms that you yeah. wanna use for those kinds of characters. Well, if you want, if you want, a, if you want a similar character like who's um, from a similar even genre, I mean, look at look at is it Nisekai? Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but look at Onodera from Nisekai. She was the yeah. Nisekai. She was the Miku of that series. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, she and, uh, eh, she kind of what Nis Nisekai runs into a lot of other problems that we don't really need to Nisekoi fuck. Or yeah, you don't need to learn about it either. It's it, yeah. don't don't even bother with it. Like legitimately, if you go if you delve too deep into that, you're uh, you're wasting your time. One <laughs> and two, like you're gonna be pissed off at it. 
the fuck? Yeah. You, 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 really you, 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 could, you could watch or read it and then read, read or watch this series and you'll, you'll learn to love this series more because that, that, that one was a classic, like classic harem type with all the tropes, included all the, the annoying tropes. Which which makes this one more refreshing because I came into this one like some years after that one when Nisakai had finished. So, Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, yeah. So I and I do want to say this. I've talked a lot about how you know I I was rooting for Miku and you know the fact that Fudaro chose Yotsuba and not Miku. How that kind of stuck in my craw. The fact of the matter is, Neji did a really good job of developing all of these characters, all of these girls, which is another thing that sets this apart from other harem animes. He did a really good job of developing all five of these quints. And, you know, we've talked a lot. Yes, Miku was insanely popular, but so was Nino, so was Itsuki, so was Yotsuba. Like, it was going to stick, you know, whichever quint uh, Neji decided to go with, it was going to stick in a lot, a lot of people's craw, no matter what. And so the fact, and he again, he knew what he was doing. He knew it was he. He knew it was going to be Yotsa, but he and again, he was approaching it like a mystery. He always planned on it winding up to be Yotsa, but, and Yotsa is a sweetheart and is wonderful, and you can't hate her, even if you don't agree with the decision for Fudaro to be with her. You can't hate Yotsa, but, and. So it would, and so you know, I do want to make that very clear that I do not hate Yotsuba. I do not hate, you know, the ultimate decision. It, I understand that it was always going to be a, you know, it was always going to be a tricky decision. It was always going to, you know, ha- it was always going to have that reaction where most, I would say, no matter what, most of the people, even if it was Miku, most of the audience was going to react like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I guess that works. Well, I mean, if you if you look at the fandom for a long time, like you, ha- everyone would support their choice of waifu very viciously, except for when it came. They were, if if you said it was someone else, they would react very aggressively. Except if you said it was Yotsuba, then it was kind of like it was almost quite widely accepted. It's like like I, my waifu better win. Oh, I bet Yotsuba's a got Yotsuba's an alright second. We don't mind her. It's like yeah. it's like she was the general. Everyone seemed to like her, even if they preferred another oh, yeah. girl. Yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah, because Yotsuba like was, 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 was always the more. Well, Yotsuba was, was always the most overtly supportive of everyone, uh, yeah. to her detriment a lot, to her physical detriment uh, a lot of times. Yeah, and uh, I want to talk about. Uh, we kind of mentioned this arc before, but the Labor Day Thanksgiving. Because what really mm-hmm. keeps sticking out to me, and it's the most recent thing I, I wrote for the the breakdown series I'm doing, uh, is how that's structured. Because the whole idea behind it is Futuro trying to pay her back for supporting him during the bonfire arc and, and filling in yeah. for him when he was sick and stuff. But what ends up happening is Yotsuba takes that opportunity not to get with him, not to tell him the truth or anything, but to give him an insight onto all of her sisters and herself at the end. Uh, And really, like, kind of set the stage for him to help them with so much more than just their grades. Uh, Like... You know, he, he she takes him to see Ichiko's movie, a restaurant that Itsuki likes, uh, clothes shopping for Nino, uh, the spa that Miku frequents. And then at the end, you know, you got the swings, you got the, the metaphor with the chains and stuff. And uh, throughout all of that, Fudoro keeps asking, like, okay, but, but what do you want? And Yotsuba yeah. is always hesitant about it. Uh, yeah. but she kind of lets her true ideal slip a little bit, uh, when they're swinging and she's talking about all the houses and she's talking about how, um, she comes up here, comes up there when she's feeling lonely or tired or stressed. And we see that a little bit through her, through her flashback stuff. Uh, 
and how looking at all the houses and thinking of each one of those lights as a family that are together is is what she admires and what she strives for and then she gets Futuro to laugh and food and at the end uh Futuro's like but I never got you what you wanted and she says yes you have I already got what I wanted uh which was that smile that damn smile uh <laughs> and you know she she wanted to to help him like she again she had the perfect opportunity to be selfish here but she's like no i'm going to use this opportunity to help fudero and wait, she ended wait, up wait, that's, she, that's, I mean, that, that's a lot of her early problems which it may sound yeah. paradoxical but part of the reason i like quite i quite like this there was partly because I tend to enjoy sometimes when characters suffer in their stuff, they have to deal with all these problems. And the fact that literally you saw that arc, like, so like, what do you want to do? And it's like, ah, what, what do I want to do? Like, their other parts, like, build it up, the whole festival, even kind of when she's literally collapsing things. I, like, she never really put herself first since her flashback, really, like, the events of the past. And I really enjoyed watching that, waiting for that mo- the moment where she finally she could, because it was like, try- it was her like having to break those chains, as you said. Like, yeah, like, uh, it was enjoyable to watch. Yeah, I mean, like Robert said, you can't hate Yotsuba unless mm-hmm. you're really good at hating things, because it's a <laughs> skill-based fucking thing. Okay. <laughs> You gotta really strive to be like the Doom Slayer when it comes to hating Yotsuba. And I think that I may have finally reached that point. (laughs) Because here's the thing. Much as you can say, oh, Yotsuba's a sweet girl. Yotsuba was always trying to help out Futaro and stuff. Yotsuba's this, Yotsuba's that. Uh, She's fucking annoying. Like, Aww. she's stupid, she's kind of <laughs> fucking dumb, she's got a stupid hairstyle and a stupid bow. I don't like how she <laughs> looks compared to, like, any of the other girls. Uh, fucking, she's... You can't really use dumb as a detriment here. They were all dumb. <laughs> yeah. She I mean, was, she was especially, Yeah, she was, I mean, that, yeah. that was just, like, a, a major point in the plot was that she is the, the dumbest queen. <laughs> Oh yeah, like when, she tries, when they're trying to get all the the numbers of the fo- and the numbers of the girls, and then it's like, wait, one, two, three, four, Jessica, that's me. It's yeah. like kind of like realizes she she was like forgot herself. I mean, it is true though that they're all kind of knuckleheads in other in 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 one way or another. Even Fudero is supposed to be you know Mister Genius, but it's oh he got... is emotionally stunted he... like no one's fucking business. Yeah, no, he's definitely got those. I think I I don't know. I feel like a part of it is just like he's so single minded basically that he can't like, <laughs> he can't even recognize the ultimate when she's wearing like, her name on her chest. Like but, like th- yeah. throughout the entirety of the story, the only character who like acts like a normal functioning human being who has their shit together is Raiha. <laughs> yes, yeah, the twelve-year-old girl. Yeah, which that, I don't know. That to me is where I'm able to look. Is where I'm just able to like hand wave it in and say, eh, "It's funny." It's I don't know. Like I don't know. I know you said you didn't find this particularly funny media, but I found this. I I found this series hilarious. There was always something that I found myself laughing about, and uh, I don't know. And unlike with uh, we never learn, I feel like I don't know. It felt more like the the idiocies were kind of more due to, I guess, character flaws, or they were just due to like who these characters were as per as people well, they, they as opposed they to with. Get the whole... uh, we never learn. It feels like a lot of the stupidity that goes on is just like for the sake of whatever hijinks the characters are getting into the this week, basically. Like that's well, like, that's why like, I the, the thing that's is, why I couldn't get the, through the that thing one. Thing is with the Quints. Go ahead. Uh, they didn't have anybody except each other. Uh, you know, yeah. th- their mom, even when she was alive, she was always sick. Uh, and, and then yeah. she was dead. And Biodad never met him. Uh, 
adopt a dad maruo maruo absentee, Maruo yeah. absentee. He's, he's always working he, he's he's out saving lives yeah. in the hospital as a surgeon uh yeah. their tutors were always just professional obligation and that's what they uh itsuki especially thought futuro was at first um yeah was he was he was just another tutor just another person who was just in it for the money just it's another person that, daddy was. that first he was uh yes yeah. he absolutely was but th- there was a reason for it and that's one of the things i love about futuro so much and what i love about yeah. the story is uh and this is a pretty like simple thing but it's you'd be surprised how many stories fuck this up Money yeah. and power are amazing motivating factors, but they are never. <laughs> always for they, they are never an end. Why do like yeah. why does Futuro want money? Because it's not just to have money. Because he his little have, sister is starving. <laughs> yeah, he he wants to support his his family. He, and this is something I I, I super relate to. It's why I absolutely love his interactions with Raiha because it reminds me a lot of my me yeah. and my little sister. Um, who also has her shit together way more than I do, by the way. <laughs> uh, so he he wants to support them because he spent so long being kind of a burden and being a little shit uh, back in the day. Uh, and th- there's probably a bit of himself that, that blames himself in, in a similar fashion that Yotsuba blames herself for all the problems her and her sisters are facing. There, there might be a little bit of Futuro that blames himself for uh, his, his father's situation. Like, if, if his father wasn't, you know, having to, to support him and Raiha, he could have gotten, like, all the debts cleared yeah. already. No, it doesn't, it doesn't, really, it doesn't really it doesn't really delve yeah. deep into that. Uh, yeah. Which but, is one thing I wish they kind of would have done, actually, uh, is maybe I mean, explore I mean, that a little bit more. Maybe tell show did. us more of Futuro's mom, but... Yeah. Anyway, sorry. If they, go ahead, if, they, so. if they did, it would have had to have been in flashbacks because by the time we jump into the yeah. story, it's clear that Isanari is a loving and caring <clears> father <throat> enough to where uh, Futuro like no longer feels like a burden, but he still wants to pay it forward and do all that stuff. And yeah, uh, no, I am I am kind of surprised how, how much how much we're way. talking about the last festival because <laughs> there's a bit in the last festival arc where it does have a flashback with him and Takabayashi. Uh, and it's talking about Yashi's flashback where Futuro says like uh, so, something along the lines of I'm a vacuous person who, who's good for nothing. I just want one thing that I'm proud of. And he finds that in the quints. Uh, yeah. he, fi- he finds something that, that is more than just a cash cow. He finds something that gives him honest to God fulfillment. And it's a group effort and they all have a hand in playing and, and uh, to play in doing that, which is why he loves all five of them by the end, because yeah. without all five of them, he wouldn't have had that level of fulfillment. Uh, but it ultimately is Yotsuba that he picks with yeah. that said, I find his interactions with Ichika and Itsuki to be way more endearing because they don't win and because it it never goes beyond the platonic level so let's talk about let's talk about ichika for a little bit i actually do want to say something real quick about futuro just while we're on that subject because i don't know that is another i talked about this a little i know i've been talking a lot and i'm very sorry about that but i do like how atypical of a again the my limited experience with harems, I may be completely wrong about this, but I do like how atypical he is that he starts off uh, in the first chapter insulting Itsuki, and he basically, ha- like, I love that he doesn't, I don't know, that he really has to work and he- to actually gain, you know, get their affections and just to let them, you know, he has to work just to get them to be willing to be in the same room with him, basically. And, like, it takes him 50 chap, basically, like, 50 chapters of 122 chapters to finally, you know, get through to Nino on a level where she's willing to let him tutor him. And so I really like that. that. And yet, at the same time, despite how atypical he is, the fact that he's a jerk at first, he also manages to be very endearing and very... 
uh, and someone that you want to root for because of his relationship with Rai Hai, his relationship with his dad, and the fact that, you know, like you said, you know, he's, yes, he's after money. He has a very selfish motivation, but you understand why. So, yeah, Fudoro's a, a fantastic, a really interesting uh, uh, harem uh, protagonist, and there need to be more like him. So it, 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 also, it also helps the fact that a lot of harem protagonists are extremely dense, which is mostly to keep the harem going for as long as possible. Yeah. Like, Futuro recognizes their feelings. Like, he knows he doesn't act on for a while because he doesn't, he's still trying to process it, process it himself and she's willing to give the time. Miku's, yeah. he's been kind of like realizing. It's like, he, yeah. and eventually we get the festival where he's was- go- going for it. And that was one of my favorite parts, actually, about the uh, Sister Wars arc, is that he's like, yeah, no, Nina, Miku's in love with me. Like, she never says it, but he's like, yeah, no, she's definitely in love with me. I don't know why she said that, you know, she wants me to be with Ichika. Like, that is also one of my favorite parts and one of my favorite things of his character, that, yeah, he's not a dense moron. So, go ahead, TK. Sorry, I, uh, I need to stop talking. <laughs> no, 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 that was me done there. Um, yeah. Media, you were, you were saying about Itsuki? I think. Uh, I mean, I was going to talk uh, about Ichika first. But I'll well, yeah, Ichika. Ichika he, he, the, the only thing about Ichika is that he's a fucking psychotic ass bitch. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, having grabbed the wrist to stop the knife from piercing me at one point in my life, I can say this: you can't always grab that wrist. You're not always fast enough, boys. So just avoid those. Okay, it's a good <laughs> thing that Ichika didn't end up the winner, because otherwise Futuro would be six feet under. Well, like, are we, are we, are we sure that the are we sure that when he eventually is in Senate to married life, are we sure one day he's not just gonna realize he might have slept with the wrong sister because each <laughs> girl might still might still be after him? Well, hold, hold, hold up, hold up. <laughs> such thing as see that that's the, the real sister. reason why they did the Quint name oh at the wedding was to make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah, no, I do, like we said, uh, it was, vi- like, Ich Ichika did have a very interesting arc, and, like, she is vi- a very interesting character, and again, it's one of those things where, kind of like you said, Media, you know, that her interactions are interesting because she doesn't win, and, yeah, she definitely has, the- or, yeah, she definitely goes on a very dramatic journey, and again, kind of like you said, you know, well, she was she was super predictable about not winning though. Uh, uh, like uh, her and <laughs> Itsuki were like, yeah. everybody was like, yeah, those two ain't it. The, it it yeah. ain't happening for them. Like, well, I mean, I- Itsuki I think- had had the way till first girl met that that like people thought she was still gonna win, and people feared that. Because he, she had the tropes of a first girl, like even had some of the scenes, the private family moments, like you know that you'd expect first girl to have, and who normally ends up being end girl. Like that was a big thing that gave a lot of support behind her, like which worried a lot of people. No, she was completely. Uh, she she was the one who was dense the whole damn time. If you want to fucking like, she she had the fucking harem protagonist trope of. Uh, knowing what the fuck was going on until it was oh God, already too late and she was like, with yeah. oh yeah in the, in the swimming in the swimming park where um, <laughs> and she's let she realized oh i had to keep them all away he started a war between my sisters what am i gonna do uh, yeah. yeah i think i think i might have i think i got into this series like i want i also watched the anime first I think I started watching it around the time Chapter 74 came out. And I think I was kind of like, oh, wow, I like uh, Miku and Ichika. I think I'm rooting for one of them. And you guys were like, and I think media was all like, uh, have you, how, where are you at in the manga right now? It's all like, oh, I haven't started it yet. You were like, keep reading. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, no, fucking, uh, that is, that is basically, well, I got into the manga through the because media was talking some shit about it, and I was like, fine, whatever, I'll check it out. I ain't got nothing better. And fucking, uh, I, you know what? Let's let's actually get around to this fine, because this is like a, a really major arc that we haven't talked about, and it's the one that hooks you in in the first place. Is the fucking bonfire arc, like, 
I don't know what yeah. we're gonna say about it, but yeah. fuck. I mean, we that, ain't that, that, about that'll, it. that'll... It's definitely one that sets a lot of the stage for what's yeah. going to happen later on. You know, it's Iski starting to Fair, not really respect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Starting to really respect that. It's kind of planting the seeds of, you know, Ichika and Miku's um, rivalry there. And it is it is pretty interesting to see, like, where that arc kind of ends and then where things end in the future. Again, Ichika goes on a real, goes on a real trip here, you know, throughout this series where she goes from, you know, kind of thinking to sacrifice, you know, about sacrificing herself, wanting to you know, kind of wingmanning um, Miku to be with Futuro, but then, and then, you know, starting there and then ending up. And again, it's, you know, a really a very interesting character arc there that she goes through to eventually, you know, basically stabbing Miku in the back. So, so yeah. yeah, it's definitely interesting uh, there to see where it all starts. But yeah, and, it, and you, like you said, it's a really good hook. So, so Ichika. At the start of the story, I think she's actually in a very similar position that Yotsuba was in her flashback uh, in middle school, where she's ready to just blow the whole quintuplets thing to smithereens and just say, fuck y'all, I'm out. Uh, But throughout this whole thing, she's extremely conflicted because much like Nino, she does love her sisters more than anything, but... Unlike Nino, she is constantly trying to kind of compromise those ideals to get what she wants. And at first, it's just the the career. Like, she's willing to put her relationship with her sisters uh, in, into a very precarious situation because she's not telling them what's going on. Like, if she, if she gets the part, she'll, like, ask for forgiveness, and, and hopefully they'll accept it. But if she doesn't get the part, and she says this, like, she'll never be able to look them, look them in the eye again. Because she wants to do something that, that she's proud of, much like Futuro, that, that's, part of, that's the part of her that, that Futuro kind of gravitates towards, is this dream-chasing idiot that she is. Uh... She, she wants something that she's proud of, and she's constantly struggling between doing the right thing and doing the selfish thing. And so she realizes her feelings for Futuro during the bonfire arc. And it's super dramatic about it, too, with, with the, like, she has the little cry moment where she, she catches herself tearing up, uh, spending time with Futuro. Um... And she tries to repress it for a long time until she realizes that it's it's not just Miku. That that you know she she was repressing it to to avoid this conflict, but now not only is Miku in love with him, but Nino's in love with him too, and that conflict is now inevitable. And she doesn't know what to do. She's feeling lost, and then Yotsuba kind of guides her to to be like. You know, fuck it, I'm going to do what I want. But because she feels so behind in the game, uh, particularly behind Miku, and uh, I do think that her initial snake moment was just spur of the moment. She happened to have the Miku wig. She happened to be wearing it to avoid fanboys. Uh, Futuro just happened to be bragging about uh, his success in the Scrambled Eggs arc. And... That kind of like makes her snap into this Futuro's up for grabs. Uh, if he really did recognize Miku but isn't recognizing me, that means he, he's not there yet, but is getting close. I need to do something right now. And yeah. and she does. And then it's in for a pound, uh, in for a and penny. Then, yeah, in for a penny, in for yeah, a pound. For a penny, in for a pound because she lied to him. And she has to keep up that lie throughout the Sister War arc to a point where Futuro does find out and loses a lot of trust in her. And it's trust that she does gain back, but at that point, there kind of was no recovering because she... 
and, and she really, throughout the rest of the story, she kind of just gets back to where her and Futuro were during, like, the Seven Goodbyes arc. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, as you said, like, that, but, that moment where, like, he's, he, as he said, I don't trust you anymore. Like, we even know some part of what she's saying is the truth, like what she's saying about, uh, you know, you met me in the past and things, but it's like, it was because of all the damage she'd done, but at that point, it didn't matter that she was telling the truth, even if he could identify it. Like, he yeah. couldn't trust the words coming out of her mouth because, like, and it, once she started the app, she literally went all in. She was like, well... I've, I've done this now. I'm going to see this through to the end. And I think what he actually said was, I don't care. Or like, I think that, like, I think that's what he actually said there. It's like, I don't, it doesn't matter if you're telling the truth right now, you've, you've ruined this. You know, you've ruined us. Yeah. Like he, he has no reason to believe her at that moment because she's already done such a, a series of yeah. foul moves of desperation. And that's what it was. It was it absolute. Really tragedy, de- it but... is absolute desperation that drove her to do the things she does uh, between the scrambled eggs and the end of uh, Sister War, um, <clears throat> and it's something that that she ultimately pays the price for, but does kind of yeah. come back on top and fulfills her character arc, and it's so internal, and it's uh it it's after the last festival. It's. I think it's actually the first chapter after the last festival where she's playing tennis with Futuro and she gets put basically in, in a very similar situation that she was back in chapter 74 where, mm-hmm. okay, he kind of confessed to Yotsubo, but Yotsubo ran. You know, y- Yotsubo yeah. kind of denied his feelings. So he's still up for grabs and she like reaches out to him and she could, she's even thinking that like, I could be that person I could be here for him now. This is my chance to win. And she pulls back. Yeah. Because it's not the right thing to do. Because she's aware of you. Because at that point, she is aware of Yotsuba's feelings. And she knows why Yotsuba is hesitant. And she wants to. <laughs> at at that moment, that, that, is, that is the first time where she does something that isn't in her best self interest. And does something completely selfless for Futuro. <laughs> And for Yotsuba. Yeah. Uh, so, now that I said my piece about Ichika, and th- there's so much more to all of these character arcs. Like, we, we cannot do all of them justice mm-hmm. in this podcast, I think. Well, but, we're already, like, two hours in. Like, yeah. you got to have three hours? Man, have yeah. we been doing that long? I have not been keeping track. I am yeah. way too hammered right now. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, let, let's let's get on to Itsuki because I think Itsuki is the most interesting of the five. She's certainly my favorite. Um, yeah. Not as a love interest though. I never really bought her as, yeah. as a love interest, but as I think that's kind of the general consensus is yeah. like she's not a great love interest, but she's a fantastic character, and she is. Uh, she's a lot like great. Futuro, and I I think that's yeah. why. Uh, to, to answer yeah. both of those questions, because Futuro is a very interesting character, and so Itsuki being yeah. similar is interesting, and at the same time, yeah. because it's kind of, <laughs> it, it it's kind of on the nose about that. Like Ichika straight up says it in, uh, I don't remember which chapter, but it's when he's staying the night. Uh, that part, Ichika's like, you two are just so much alike. You you don't even realize, like everything you're doing right now. <laughs> Is, is exactly um, the stuff that she would do. And we see that, like, uh, I get that, that a lot. The first exam, I think, is what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, the midterms, the midterm arc. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I know a lot is lost in translation. Uh, apparently, <laughs> they use a lot of the same, like, mannerisms and, and honorifics <laughs> and stuff and, and have the a very similar, like, vocal pattern, uh, which... That that's it kind of does come across in the anime, at least in the Japanese uh, dub. Um, which kudos to Inori Manase and uh, I don't remember Fudero's voice actor, but they both do a very excellent job in both uh, dubs, uh, the Japanese yeah. dub, and then also uh, with Tia Ballard and Josh Grell in the English dub. I think they're two of the highlights of the English dub, especially. Um, but 
I Ichiki's, still love Josh Grell's delivery of yeah. love. Ichiki's whole deal is that she is so uptight. Yeah. She just mm. needs a fucking chill pill. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Like she like I, it, it, it borders on pretentious uh and you can definitely see like the anxiety that's causing especially and, and that same as ichika is saying that her and fudra are like it kind of cuts to iski and it's like she's she's i bet she's suffering right now she's just like crying her eyes out because like she is so japanese <laughs> She is so she is so afraid of like showing emotions because that's not the proper thing to do, you know. J- Japanese people are, are all about like, you know, being very they're, they're very serious. Uh, it's a very serious culture for serious people, and she just yeah bottles it up and and um uh, 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 I, I'm look I'm blanking on, on the on the word, repressed. She is a very yeah. repressed character. And we slowly kind yeah. of see her open up. And we see her open up uh, in large part due to Futuro. Um, and we see her open up to Futuro in ways that she doesn't... That we don't see her open up to her sisters. Uh, particularly with, with her desire yeah. to be a teacher. And uh, in the last festival, when when they kind of reflect uh, back on chapter one. Uh, with the whole, like, can you please help me study and... Futuro actually says yes. Um, yeah. And also, I think, uh, even though she is the most serious character, Ichiki is also the best source of comedy in the series because <laughs> a lot of times it's su- a lot of times it's subtle. And it's never <laughs> like, she never like gorges herself, but she is always eating something. And it's usually something small. But like, the, <clears throat> like one of my favorite panels uh it's actually in the Yotsuba flashback and it when it goes to, through the the fireworks art from Yotsuba's perspective and there's just this bit with Ichiki shoving a corn dog in her mouth that's in the background like she's in the background between Ichika and, and Yotsuba I think just chopping on a hot dog going like Grr! <laughs> with this derpy ass face uh that that's one of the, like best laughs I've had reading the series uh, I love her so much. Do you remember after the festival? She was stuffing her face, like literally, like the moment it, like the stress was gone, she's just eating everything in sight. <laughs> yeah, the thing with Izuki is like, uh, if we boil it down to like a a narrative thing, like we've already been over that, like she was oblivious to the whole thing the entire time, almost up until the very end. At which point, she has the realization, like. But, like, uh, as far as, like, the dynamic goes between them, they were, like, so, so, like, they, they were, they were both the same, and you can't have the, the similars attract kind of thing, and so, mm-hmm. like, their dynamic didn't really lend too well yeah. to... Which is, which is idea. why they're still bickering at the goddamn wedding. Like, they just <laughs> start a fucking argument over something really stupid, because they're both uptight assholes, that just get <laughs> get like annoyed by little things that they do. Well, it, it doesn't help the fact she was she he went to like and you're Itsuki, but I'm Yotsuba. Oh yeah, she was fucking with them. Which I thought <laughs> I thought that was kind of a a, a little nod to the whole Rena situation. It was, it was a brilliant moment, just because it's the hair there. It's like oh oh, oh did he get it wrong? Mm, yeah. I will say this, though, uh, even though that's not uh, Futuro's type of girl, it is mine, because the only girl that I can truly say that I've ever been in love with was a straight-laced chick who often butted heads with me. Uh, So, if you're one of those type of ladies, uh, check me out somewhere. I don't fucking know. I'm Cooper Delaney Martin, and I'm fucking desperate. Uh, Not again. By the way, Sophie, were you trying to say something? I know it's still splashing a bit for you a few times, the oh, Discord. No. no, that's just because of the sensitivity of my mic. Oh, yeah. But uh, mm-hmm. I will I will add in a little bit just with the, the with regard to Itsuki. I feel that Itsuki's character may have actually been better served 
in the narrative if Negi had actually just gone the full nine yards and made her a purely platonic support character. Um, I feel that both the fans of Itsuki as well as just Itsuki's character in general was actually done more harm than good by having her come to some sort of romantic realization so late after the fact, particularly given the fact that it happens post festival. Um, yeah, that... post all of her mm-hmm. basically being the cheerleader for Yotes and Futaro to get together and it would have been a very refreshing change of pace to see one of the soon characters because she's kind of Sundere in the same way as I, I usually like to compare her to like Naru Narusagawa from uh, Love Hina. Uh, if if the really violent Sundere who also becomes aggressively romantic later on is is Nino in this case, she then she's the uh, the Motoko, but uh, but uh, Itsuki starts off fairly soon and and then becomes more or less neutral to even endeared by. Uh, uh, endeared to Futaro, um, I feel that it would have been an interesting thing to actually turn it on on its head and have the the Tsundere character who so closely resembles Futaro himself, the protagonist himself, actually turn out to be the um, the supporting character. Uh, in particular, because of the fact that usually that's a role that winds up filled by the Genki character in harem anime. Uh, you usually wind up with a Genki girl or someone who winds up never really being in the, uh, the main character's ballpark and, and winds up... Uh, playing the role of pure support by the end and I think that if Itsuki had been fully developed to just being like I think of Futaro and his family as an extension of my own family and I'm close to his sister and I have a kind of sisterhood or or, or like a sister a brother sister like relationship with him and I want him to be happy and I want my sisters to be happy I think that would have served her narrative so much better than to have this 11th hour love realization that's already yeah. doomed to failure by the narrative's yeah. own hand. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah. I don't, I yeah. never really thought of it as, as an actual love thing. Uh, crush and um, just admiration for him. Uh, yeah, she, does, she, she doesn't, she doesn't she admire him. Her... She, she didn't want to be like her mother, and her mother did like a teacher. Oh so. God! Well, well, the thing is, though, the thing is, though, you got to remember, media, that that that, yeah, you you can make those those little nitpicks about oh, it was just like a crush and admiration and stuff. But the thing is, is that in in in, in an anime narrative like this, they're basically considered to be one and the same because their high school their high school age is is ending is coming to a close and in japan high school is like it it is it is the time in a person's life when they have the most freedom before they have to become an adult and join join the workforce or go to college to join the workforce and do all this other kind of stuff Uh, and so the romances that you have the friendships that you make all of that stuff that that happens in high school is some of the most precious to to people uh at that point in their lives so her experiencing a romance for the first time like these romantic feelings and she does come to realize that you know they make a point of showing that she comes to realize that it's jealousy and she comes to realize that yes this is a love and yes it is an unrequited love and that in itself can be beautiful which is why she gives advice to the girl saying you know even even if you have a love that's doomed from the start you know that 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 just the fact that you experienced it is yeah. it can be a beautiful thing um it it, it 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 it's it's meant to be like a powerful thing but in truth it kind of diminishes itsuki's character by making her uh once again uh, just another part well, of the harem well kind of yeah exactly because uh she she had her own thing going for her up to that point and had kind of 
developed her characterization away from being an actual member of like the the quote unquote harem. And then by the end of it, she she acknowledges, oh no, I do have feelings for him. And then oh, in the very end, we're being given this like kind of like epilogue where all five girls are going on the honeymoon and all this other stuff. And it's like, okay, so 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 Futaro basically did walk away with what is if not a harem in truth, a harem in perception at the very least, because he has five women all unattached to any other guy or relationship following him around and engaging in his personal life to such a degree that you kind of go, um, what? (laughs) Wait, you think that's bad? One of them married to Kata or something like that between that and... No, no so that, that was a fucking meme. Yeah, that yeah, meme. he found a different chick. And that <clears throat> so, was... no, 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 no. Oh, or no, uh, Maida. 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 Maida has a wife. No, Maida, Maida got married. Yeah, Maida got married, and his wife is pregnant. When we see her in the flash forward, Takeda, we never see again. And yeah. some people have I, taken. I, I, some people have taken that to mean that he has probably gotten involved with the actual, like, space program and may have even succeeded in his dream of becoming an astronaut, which, hey, yeah. good for I him. Am, <laughs> I am kind of bummed that nobody in, like, the at the wedding was holding up a, a like, a laptop and him Skyping on the other end floating that in space been so or something. Cute. No. I, would, I, I, I will say this, okay? Mm-hmm. I did figure out just to know where the honeymoon is, okay? It's in Utah in the United States the, so that uh, Futuro can legally marry all five oh, no. points now oh, due to the change in the state laws. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you're, you're the Mormon boy here, Robert. You're a fucking so, state. Yes, and, I, <laughs> yes, and that me. is how I know that is no longer actually legal. Uh, and it hasn't it has... we haven't practiced that in over a hundred years. And yet your state just changed the law. So what are you going to do now? Not marry multiple women? I wouldn't. I would take as many chicks as I could get my hands on, and you know that for a damn fact. Oh my god. Anyway. Jesus. <laughs> I, I, I feel like this is how, this is anyway. how you meet the Yandere types. Yes, it is. Anyway. But, so, I, and, yeah, just my thoughts on Iski. Um... Yeah, no, she's she's also great in every scene she's in. I do think that um, she is a much more interesting and compelling character as just Fudro's best friend, basically, as his, you know, yeah, you know, as just his best friend who's uh, there for him and they support each other. And even if it was one of those things where, like, they both, you know, be, where like they both go into the same field and they both teach together or something. We don't. Yeah, it's I'm, it's kind of weird that we don't really get a cl- seem to get a clear explanation of what Fudro does at the end, even though he's Mister Genius and stuff. But, I would but yeah, that. like did he, he like like yeah. birds or something in the something in the country when they did the exams? Uh in the yeah. mock exams, yes. <laughs> Yeah, he uh, ranked that was, that third and mostly just board. because he passed out halfway. Like yeah. he got he got really good scores in the exams, but we also know that come the the time of the wedding, he's still more or less destitute, which means he probably yeah. didn't land the big businessman job that he was hoping for. Yeah. But if he's destitute, but he also has a career, that could point to a situation where maybe he did enjoy tutoring people, and maybe he did wind up taking a yeah, teaching I job. Think, uh, th- this is this is purely head. <laughs> or he's on my just part. owning his. Uh, th- this this is purely yeah. headcanon on my part. I think he has a well-paying job, but I think he's new at the company. Yeah. Like we we know Maruo mm. is, pay, is paying is paying for probably the, we know, just, he's we probably know pretty fresh out of college, right? Yeah, we know, oh, Maru, yeah. we know it hasn't been that long. Like, it's been five years since the start of the story, so it's actually more like four years since uh, graduation. So he's probably actually fresh at, like, him and Itsuki both are probably fresh out of college and new yeah. at their job. Whereas, like, Ichika yeah. is, is, has, you know, well-established actress at that point. And uh, Miku and Nino, we, we don't know how long they've been in business. And I don't know how long... Uh, or you go to culinary school for but uh like him and Itsuki probably are kind of like new at whatever job that they have uh yeah, whether, plus, it's together, whether it's together we, or not i mean it's confirmed that Itsuki is a teacher now but yeah yes 
Plus, we've got to consider as well the fact that he's probably also filling, filling money into writers' education. Like, so that's they're not fully paying off the debt as yeah. fast as they can. He's kind of prob- uh, he's I trying to make the, sure yeah, that I she can do debt, what she wants. I think the I debt might be paid. Mm-hmm. They're just still dirt poor yeah. because Isanari doesn't make a whole lot of money. <laughs> Uh, Raiha doesn't say yeah. anything about her working, and she's still she's still a, a, a student. And then yeah. so so you got Futuro at whatever <laughs> fresh new job he has. Like they're just they're always going to be poor. I just don't I don't <laughs> think that I think the debt has been paid off through yeah. their efforts, and that's one of the reasons why they're able to open up that that restaurant for Nino and Miku. But uh, because that was the reason why they were in debt. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're they're just they're just poor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i do i don't know i do but yeah i love itsuki um my <laughs> i don't know if this is true but i do know like the story of how neji you know wanted to introduce all five quints at first but his editor was like it, it's probably better if you introduce them one at a time and so you know he he knew one of the okay one of them has to be the first even though it was so it can't be yosuba because you know I don't want people saying, you know, that first girl won, even though she kind of technically does. But well, like first girl <laughs> mostly kind of refers percent. to the first girl mostly refers to the first girl that appears. I know, more, or like or first, the first girl that like the hair rather than the actual the first girl ever bet. Like yeah. that's a bit uh, if, if, actually it's uh it's divided up amongst the actual works enough to where there is differing opinions on what it actually refers to off it so like you will find some people who give you the definition like Takei just did where it's the yeah. first one who actually shows up and you will find yeah. a lot of others probably half and half who will be like oh it's the first girl he has ever met that yeah. are competitors so yeah. unfortunately so, there's no out out and out fucking well stated thing for it which, yeah. mm-hmm. like, unless yeah. you're autistic, yeah. it's not a big so, deal. Who gives a shit? So, about yeah. so, uh, so I do. So with that whole thing, I do wonder. Um, like, I did kind of wonder, like, did, if Neji heard that and was kind of, and was basically just like, okay, which of these quints could Futuro offend the most? Like, I want Futuro to just basically start out yeah. at the bottom here and have to work his way, you know, into all of their good graces. So who can I put him with that he will offend the most easily? It's key. Yeah, I mean, that uh, makes sense. We, all, we already we already know the reason yeah. behind why Negi made uh, Itsuki the first uh, the first girl introduced, and it's because the editor suggested it oh, yeah. because the, the she editor... seemed like more of the heroine type. Yeah, the, the editor okay, apparently I didn't was know, a. I didn't know the editor suggest like was uh, that specific. So, or so... I just know he said pick one. But yeah, go ahead. So, so, so we we we're, we've been going for a while. So, uh, let's Sorry. let's enter the the final <laughs> section. And uh, I got we got some uh, questions sent to us, uh, lovely fans of the channel. Uh, first one is actually specifically for me. It's from a uh, GQ Smith who is a Patreon, uh, or mm-hmm. patron. Um, He's also a cool dude. Yes. What's up, G? Uh, for the for the Quince podcast for you, would you even have watched the show to begin with if it wasn't all redheads? Um, <laughs> I don't like the implication there. Uh, I like plenty of other things. <laughs> I that very much redheads, like that implication but, there. But I will and I say. Will support it. But I will say, it wouldn't have caught my eye. With that said, uh, with as many people on, on the Discord that were reading it, uh, like, you know, Coop and Takei T- T- and Retro, um, I would have probably seen something that caught my eye anyway, if it was written the same way and didn't have redheads. Uh, I, I would have saw, saw something that caught my eye. Uh, next one uh, from... from um, at loop free on twitter just sent me a meme it's 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 just ho sad uh yeah. top <laughs> so now let's uh pull up the youtube questions Do-do-do-do-do. all right first one is from lk uh which quint do you pref- uh personally prefer and which one do you think suits Fidero the best winner aside so uh we'll we'll, we'll go just Real quick, in the talking order, so Takei? Well, obviously, my favourite is Miku, because I think I've made that clear throughout this entire discussion. Um, personally, I think 
think I would prefer to kind of, but I think she would have suited him the most, but equally, I, I'm still satisfied with Yotsuba, but I will still go with Miku Miku. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Coop? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, fucking... Well, there's uh, there's actually two different answers here. My personal <laughs> favorite is, of course, Miku. Okay, but the one who suits him most, I think I might actually have to go with Ichigo here. Because, like, even though she does go psycho a little bit, like, ultimately, she's just, like, a kind of chill normal girl, usually. Most of the time, if she didn't fucking run into those opportunities to fucking snake on some bitches, probably wouldn't have. But then again, like for most normal girls, if the fucking dude is in the middle of the fight, the claws are coming out anyway. So she's basically just like your average chick. Futaro might have been better off going with her. Um, Robert? Um... Yeah, no, I gotta go with Miku for both of them. She was my favorite, and I made this very clear. Yeah, you know, Miku. So. And Sophie. I've talked enough. Okay, well, <clears throat> if we have to do winner aside, then I would probably say Miku. Um, I do kind of make the argument, uh, and I've actually done a lot of discussing about this particular topic as far as suitability for Futaro in the actual um, Quintuplets Discord, uh, particularly with some of the members of the Yokuza who were much more in-depth with the psychological analysis than I was, including, but not limited to, uh, uh, Horoth, who um, was a fellow who went deep into the whole um, personality uh personality testing psychological profiling of the of the characters as a whole and basically pointed out that when you really really like break them down if you're going to categorize them on a psychological level uh in a personality level when you really really break them down the only person who really is a a a, a suitable match uh for futaro like in pretty much every way is the character of Yotsuba. But, like we said, winner aside, I would say that um, I think one of the reasons that Miku would have made for a good uh, a good match for him is because Miku wanted to strive not only to improve herself in Futaro's eyes and to be, like, to be a partner who was, like, suitable to Futaro, but she had that kind of mindset of, like, I'm going to fill in for... Uh, that I could see it developing into something along the lines of, like, I'm going to de- uh, to to fill in for Futaro's weaknesses, mm-hmm. more or less. That um, if Futaro exhausts himself, I'll be there to, I'll be there to uh, comfort him. Uh, if Futaro needs this thing, I'll be prepared to have that thing done. Uh, she wanted to bond with Futaro. She wanted to get to know him better. She wanted to connect with him on a more intimate level, um, which I think plays into the fact that she's now running the Uesugi uh, bakery yeah, slash yeah. restaurant. Um, I think that that all could have led into a pretty good uh, good ending for those two characters if they'd have wound up together. But I am very much still, like, for all of the flaws with the current ending, uh, I am satisfied with Futaro and Yotsuba. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, next question uh, from Monokunkum, uh, who I recognize from the Gotoban servers. Um, mm-hmm. He asked a couple mm. questions uh, real quick, though. Uh do you think, yes or no, do you think quintessential quintuplets will influence the future of the harem genre? Okay? Hopefully. Eh, probably not. Uh, I think it will. Um, especially, especially if uh, the ad- season two of the anime does well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, very, it's, it's very, very good. It's yeah. been very well received. So, uh, hopefully they take yeah, the well, notes. Well, here's the thing. Is that, like, is it a good thing? Yeah. Will it actually influence anything? Again, 
probably not. It's sort of a one-off thing, and it's done in a very different style. And uh, a lot of the fucking uh, maybe maybe some of the editorial guys have read it and are like, let's copy this. But the the way they copy it might be off. The the way they do things with it might be off, and it might basically at that point just fall into their ditch of how they use. It. Like, uh, I mean, like there's a, there's a lot of things that are that sort of never they 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 leap out of the ditch every so often, but for the most mm-hmm. part they just stay in the ditch. And if you want to keep it within like romantic stuff the victorian uh style is also like super popular nowadays but there's only so, one of them that's half yeah. fucking decent right now in my opinion and that's the uh uh fucking uh uh, uh shit where did i have it the duke of death and his black maid that's right yeah. anyway like, uh, let's, let's get on let's get speak. on with these questions though Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, n- I didn't get to answer that particular. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I would like to say that I do think that there is already kind of a a, a, a sort of change in the wind. Uh, part of the reasoning for why this manga has ended this way is apparently that there was some dissatisfaction from people like Negi when it comes to manga that they had read in the past, where they felt, where they personally felt like hey, I feel like this kind of character should have an opportunity to shine. And Negi really kind of emphasizes that in the, um, in the, stuff, uh, in, in the stuff that you read um, that came out with the, uh, with the final chapter where he was talking about how things like, things like how he didn't, he didn't like that people were insistent that a Genki girl doesn't make for a good heroine and he wanted to write the Genki girl as the heroine and stuff like that. And other mangaka do seem to share these kinds of sentiments where they're kind of feeling a little bogged down by what has become the, the status quo of the industry. And I think that with people like, like uh, Negi or uh, Tsutsui uh, over at Boku Ben and stuff like that. I think we will be seeing more people take, kind of take the piss out of uh, 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 some of the status quo nonsense that we've seen in the industry so far. And maybe, maybe cool. we will get finally like a golden yeah. age of and, new romances. Yeah, and we've been kind of getting a little bit of that with other genres as well. Uh, I will mm-hmm. say. I, I, think, um, I think to a, I think to a degree though, like the main harem stories that will likely be affected by this are going to be the ones that are smaller in scale like if, if a harem has like 20 girls because there are harem stories like that they are generally episodic in terms of nature so, you know the plot moves very slowly because it's very much yeah. each chapter for a different girl they probably will remain exactly the same it's there's a formula that doesn't get changed much at all if it's a harem between like just a few girls then Probably that will might be evolved more. It could still be episodic, but like any, they might try and do more like like this series where yeah we have one or two episodic parts in between arcs, but there's a general flow constantly moving forwards, never really staying static yeah. for too long. So mm-hmm. uh, that that actually yeah. kind of um, actually Mono had another question like best theory uh, that you've seen. Uh, best theory is that he he uh, has some fun with all of them on the. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, that's not the best theory. The best theory is that one that uh, fucking retro posted. Oh earlier. god. Where, yeah. Uh, okay. So so um, I'll I'll actually uh, put it in the video um, right now. Uh, it's it's this picture of uh, uh, it's it's this picture of uh the the bride and it looks like she she snapped uh and then retro posted this not retro oh no yeah you posted the picture to k but then uh retro responds with it's itsuki and her rena shenanigans 
has developed personality issues. The Rena personality believes that the Quints all split off from her. To remedy this, she exacerbates Itsuki's mighty hunger in an attempt to get her to consume her sisters and reunite Rena. Oh my gosh! Oh. <laughs> Oh, well, that went dark quickly. Wow. Yeah, that's that wow. something. Okay. So, um, uh, but but that that uh that you know. Oh, uh, another question from Mono. Uh, are you excited? Yes or no? Are you excited or uh expecting something for Neji's new manga soon? Uh, I have high hopes. So I think he's yeah. a very good writer. I, I, I generally he like he is very good at subverting things. I look forward to whatever it is. I'm taking a wait and see approach just yeah. because I don't know if it's going to be in a genre that I have any interest uh, in. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, I, I don't really like to check out the different works on people. Like I've, um, like I, I didn't like how fair I did, but I like Mashima's next work because I knew I was going to check it out. Uh, the author of Kaguya Sama, I read his previous his work and I enjoyed that, so which is um, I then checked out Kaguya, which was also good. So generally. If I like the author, I'll check out what they've released next. So it doesn't necessarily mean I'll read all of it, like uh, Naruto's mm-hmm. new work, but it's always good to check it out if you think, if you like the author. Yeah, mm-hmm. I certainly will check it out. Uh, Kitty Kirishima mm-hmm. asks uh, a couple questions. Um, first one we kind of already answered throughout this podcast. What makes Quince different from your typical harem show? And she even says in parentheses, I know why. Just dab on lame harem shows for me, please. We kind of already dabbed on like Nisekoi and, and other shows. So uh, her second yeah. question, if you all took a which Quint are you test, who do you think you would get? Itsuki. Hmm. I that, would probably one, get um... I would get Miku. <laughs> I, would, I don't uh, know. My me, own. I think we've already fucking decided on that. <laughs> I, feel I, like think... we, I feel like we almost need to put just put shove a quiz in here and quickly just do it. Take yeah. a minute and quickly nah. rush through the question. <laughs> I would. I would. I. I would. I would probably be somewhere in between Yotsuba and Ichika because mm, I try. Like fun time. I, I I try to kind of have that sort of positive outlook, and I try to be more more energetic and more bubbly and stuff. But there is a sort of like a a, a, a layer down there that's a little bit darker, a little bit more mischievous, or even neck like. But yeah, okay. uh, and I I'm not gonna. Uh put the daunting task of her third question rank the quince i dare you like i i am not mentally prepared to do that maybe some other time Uh, (laughs) but her her final question is uh which quint would you have chosen for yourself if you were futuro miku miku if i was futaro i would have more than likely chosen yotsuba um probably and maybe not maybe not for the same reasons uh i think that i would have probably done it because yotsuba she is the one who throughout the entirety of like the manga really really like brings home that emotional connection particularly for futaro and for me she was the one whose interactions with both with futaro and everyone else around her I found myself enjoying and also like hyper analyzing a lot more. Like while there were points where I almost legitimately went like, yeah, I can almost see myself wanting Miku to win. I'd probably go for Yotsuba first. Uh, but if I couldn't go for Yotsuba, then I'd probably have to say Miku. I'd go to for Nino because she was the first one who said, yo, let's go out. And I would be like, bet. As long good as you lay point, it on the actually. fucking table, I'll take it. Yeah, good point, <laughs> all of you, so, okay? So, you, uh, you, you're probably, you're probably in the kind of situation where you're put in a, you're put in the situation like Futaro had, where Nino comes into the mixed bath, and you're, and you would definitely not be like so dense as to just be like, okay, who are you? <laughs> because I don't <laughs> recognize you. You would just be like, oh, we're doing this. Okay, I guess we're doing this. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> And that's how, and that is how you got you. You would have got married before you left high school. 
because the father would be like, take responsibility. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, that's the reason I didn't get married before I left high school was because we were safe about it. But I probably should have because I loved that girl. Oh. <laughs> so uh, Travis Herndon asked, uh, "Would you like the anime to do a different or or, or multiple endings for the quints?" No. 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 Uh, yes, if it's, you see, see, like, typically, what I would think about it is, it, it's an easy thing to do at this point, since he's already laid all of the other stuff out, and it can easily provide, like, just a little bit of, uh, fucking, uh, on-the-side stuff. There's no, like, set schedule uh -huh. he would have to fucking, uh, achieve with that. If he's working like on a main thing and he just uh, gets a little bit tired with it and uh, rushes off to the side to work on this a little bit, uh, just to fucking stretch his legs out, that would be a good thing for him. And that's like a thing that a lot of writers do a lot of the time. And it's also yeah. it's it's also good to keep those uh, fucking mental muscles working in that area, <laughs> especially if he goes to a different genre, which is what most people have predicted he will do. Yeah. So yeah. if if there was sure, going to be if there was going to be like a separate thing where like they did alternate endings or anything like that, I would want it to be adapted into an interactive format, like a visual novel. And if mm -hmm. you're going to do that, you have to at least go all the way and make it either a very, very in-depth and, and, and like really, really uh, content uh, rich um, story, rich all ages visual novel, or you have to make it into at least a uh, somewhat uh, somewhat deep enough to not be, you know, bo bottom shelf, bottom tier, uh, arrow gay. But I don't think that would happen. It's just not in, in Nikki's sensibilities. If we weren't going to do a visual novel adaptation or tie-in, then I'd say that I could probably approve of doing like a... Um, an another world situation like they did with uh Clanad. If the OVA episodes they did, they did either multiple OVA episodes for for each girl, like two or three each, or if they just did like one like 40, 42, like a double like a double length, uh like a double length mm -hmm. episode long OVA setup where the selection is different. Like and you could have that be the branch off point. I mean, I don't see why an OVA has to be the thing or a visual novel has to be the thing. Ultimately, telling the story is the thing. And if he tells it one way or one other way, it doesn't t particularly matter for a manga, visual novel, or OVA, whatever it is. Well, I mean, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to point out, like, the more realistic options here because usually if you're going off of a manga, manga are far less likely to have spinoffs compared to something like, say, a light novel. Mm, or, yeah. like it, like with Clannad itself, Clannad started as a visual novel with multiple roots, which is the only reason why it got uh, Another World After Story OVAs for its most popular girls apart from the 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 main heroine. So, so I'm trying to just kind of approach it from the perspective of the industry and how the industry would approach it. Uh, I get you. Uh, so, uh, Connor Hines asks, uh, most of these questions we already answered. Which was your favorite quote we already answered? Are you satisfied with the final chapter? We went on a long time for that one. Uh, and same thing with the, the, about the pacing. But, uh, and then his uh, only other question is for me specifically. Uh, how how is my breakdown series coming along? Um, uh, thank you for saying that they're some of my best videos, by the way. Uh, I am certainly most proud of them out of the stuff that I've done uh, over the last year or two. Um, uh, I kind of put uh, them on the back burner um, with, with uh, Ruby Volume 7 having just ended, and I had some stuff to do for that, and... Uh, with season two now scheduled for October, uh, there's not really that that impetus for, for me to get them out as quickly as I can. Uh, I do want one to come out late April, early May uh, will be the next one. Um, 
or one of them, and I don't know when the other one is going to come out, but then after uh, part five is not going to come out until like October or November because I'm going to use clips from season two to finish that up. Uh, Arrestus Lazardus asked the uh, same question that LK did, um, which Fudero, or which Clint suited Fudero best. And then uh, last questions from Omni Pepper. Uh, he asked, what is the best show you have ever watched? Uh, Batman the Animated Series. I don't know. I don't know what <laughs> you would have expected. <clears throat> Uh, fucking Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. <clears throat> are we talking? Are we talking about uh, which is the best in general? Which has had the most? I, just, I don't care. Impact. Just, just, just name your something. favorite. Just name something. Yeah. I. Sophie's might... falling asleep. On us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I might be tempted to say Bleach. Like I know it's not as no. you know the. Ad- some parts of it aren't as good, but it's one of the very first anime I ever watched, and it still remains one of my favorites. So it's had the it largest the impact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, uh, something different, because fuck all of y'all. My favorite show that I ever watched was fucking Gunsmoke, because my dad would always sit me in his lap when I was a, a child yeah. and nice. watch Marshall Dillon get with uh, Miss Kitty all the time even though he didn't outright do it, but we know he fucking did it uh, because he was a real Chad who would go around shooting anybody who uh, violated crimes, and it was a great fucking show, and that's why it lasted. Also, it was black and white. Uh, I don't know if I could actually, like, select just one. I I had such a broad broad palette of shows that I really loved both growing up and now as a as an adult. Um shoot. Uh I don't know. I, I, I don't think I could really name name one specifically. Mine will probably had, change in about a week. <laughs> if I had to like pick a show that just like <clears throat> yes, I would go back and I would watch that um over and over and over again if i could i'd probably say like most recently one of the one of the anime that i've really really enjoyed has been um high score girl uh which is available on netflix but the second season hasn't been hasn't been hasn't been brought to the west yet it has aired but it's not available on the official streaming platform which is netflix um that one's a really, really great romance, uh, young young love sort of anime that also goes through like the history of the second arcade boom of the '90s in Japan, uh, with like Street Fighter Two and stuff like that. Yeah, um, that's that's the, that's the like girl with purple hair, isn't it? The, they get a like young mm-hmm. like. It, 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 they, yeah, they start off as they start off as grade schoolers, and it goes from grade school through high school with this kid who's like a rival to this princess type this ojo sama type who is kind of like a a prodigy at video games even though her family frowns on that sort of activity because it's linked to delinquency um and so you get a bunch of like insight into the arcade boom and stuff like about those old school video games while also watching this kind of young love romance story bud from these two from these two people who just love fighting games <laughs> and um that's a very fun one i've watched that a couple of times uh bonded with my um boyfriend over it and uh that's it's a very sweet Aww. one i'd recommend it uh and then um he asked another question like what do you value most in a show action or storytelling Storytelling. storytelling. Not not every not every show is gonna have action. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's really gotta be the storytelling and it's gotta yeah. be able to it's gotta be able to 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 to, to move me in some way emotionally. Mm-hmm. That's the big I thing. I gotta connect like, the characters. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, the, the shows I the shows I love the most are the shows that make me either like 
and go, ah, because I feel the warm and fuzzies, or they're the shows that make me start to cry, or they're the shows that get me really, like, amped up and passionate and intense. The, the stuff that really stokes intense emotion in me is the stuff I love the most. And when when the narrative is something that I can pick apart and have fun with, I also really enjoy it. Um, there's nothing I love more than, like, really, really, really good uh, world building and lore to complement, like, the characters of a story. I think, sto- I think storytelling is definitely one of the most important. Yeah. Like, um, you know, if, if it's a show to take, action also does deserve an, like an equally large role because using a recent example, like I've quite enjoyed the arcs, the Seven Deadly Sins is currently covering in the anime is a part I really like, but the but it's been let down so much by the actual terrible fights they've animated. Like the fights aren't actually bad; they just animated them terribly. But like it's kind of. If, if, if the action is bad, it can let let the story down. But without the story, you're just watching people fight. Like what you can't get invested in why they're fighting. You need that. Though you need to understand it really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Seven Deadly Sins got its own problems. Mainly that they keep redoing shit. And uh, like the second time they fought the fucking Demon King, I was yeah. like, didn't they so... already fight this motherfucker? Yes. Uh, okay. so anyway, you can, you can so, that, that's, so that's actually um all, all we have uh, for you guys here. If you like this video and you want to see more, uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, me, Coop, and Robert, at the very least, uh, <laughs> do more podcasts than just this. We we also need to start uh, <laughs> hounding. Dude, what the heck about uh talk about Clone Wars? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I do have a quintuplets breakdown series in the works. I have the first two parts already mm-hmm. uploaded and stuff. Uh, I also do Ruby content. Check that out and just ch- check out all the links in the description. I'm going to link um my I'm actually going to link my fanfiction profile because I got a bunch of quintuplet fanfics uh that I I am proud of um as as well. Uh, my Patreon, my Streamlabs, the Discord link. Uh, yep. And I also want to give a shout out to um, Kitty Kirishima, uh, the floof artist, and uh, Sophie, who, who drew your avatar? Um, you know, I want to give them a shout uh, my, out as well. That's at I am the Trev. Uh, Trev is uh, one of my friends. Um, an artist on Drag- uh, Moscow X's Dragon Ball R and R series, as well as um, as well as one of the best uh, uh, Dragon Ball style uh, artists just around. Like he's fantastic, and he does great work. Yeah. Um, yeah, he did. He did my uh, my avatar. Yeah, because uh, the, those are, those are the three people you have to thank, as well as as well as me, because I'm the one who did a lot of the the edits on these. <laughs> but uh, the mm-hmm. the adorable little uh, avatars that we have, um, doing something I haven't quite decided what they're going to be doing or or what the the backdrop of of their poses are going to be. But uh, yeah, uh, give them a shout out. They were they were a lot of help, and they've been uh, Floof and Kitty especially have been a lot of help uh, on this channel. Um, Kitty since, since the very beginning. But anyway, that's all I have for tonight. Uh, yes. And if you are a girl who's a quintuplet oh God, who's recently go. lost. Oh, don't do this. <laughs> don't, don't do this. Group of women. Uh, check out something of mine somewhere because I could really use it. I've been on a two-year oh, dry God. spell, ladies. I, oh my god. Cut the stream. Cut the stream. Cut the stream. Cut the stream. Right, have a good night, guys, before Coop gets thirsty on y'all.